sir we'll start just another 3 to 4 minutes definitely sir definitely yeah Sir, Namaskara. Hi, Gidiri, sir. How are you? Long time. <laughs> sir, can't hear you, sir. Sir. Sir, you can unmute yourself. Okay now, Postal. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so nice of you. Thank you. So good morning. Morning, sir. Uh, how are you, doctor? It's a long time. Well, sir, you are yeah, blessings. Not... How are you, sir? Ah, it's all great. Going good. Uh, nice to see you again on screen. Uh, it's wonderful, doctor, uh, professor, Santanu, sir. Good morning. Namaste. Good morning. Namaste, sir. Namaste. Namaste. Sir, Lakshmi, sir, you are in Shumaka or in uh, Bangalore? Mysuru. Mysuru, okay. Nanna Suri na kela ke naani the ni vaga. Sir, where are you staying in Mysore, Delhi? Uh, Ramakrishna Nagara. Where sir is that? Ramakrishna Nagara. Ramakrishna so Nagara. Uh, uh, yeah, where uh, you, you will find a very ring huge, uh, uh, no, huh, end of the ring road, huge uh, uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa uh, statue there. Okay. Have you seen? It is called Andolana Circle. Ramakrishna Circle. Ah, Andolana Circle. Yes, 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 uh, yes, sir. Very close by, very close by, walking distance. Very, close, very nice, sir. very nice. Come down sometime, we'll meet. <laughs> uh, so good. So, um, waiting for audience to load in. Yesterday, Chanagi Aitu, Santanu sir, Bada Shama Madidare, learn what's there, sir. I was there uh, yesterday when you gave your uh, talk, sir. Morning uh -huh. session, inauguration. Uh, yeah, it is only thoughts. <laughs> no, <ta. laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it a spontaneous. Uh, Professor Santanu made me to say something. They all it was nice. It was nice. All of them have worked, and uh, I'm just there with them. Uh, Nimitta. Nice. Uh, it is a feast. <laughs> it is a feast. Uh, Shantanu, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, on my screen, I am getting uh, like I need to admit people who are coming in. I am getting those messages. No, no, I am doing that. You need not to because we have met you co host. No, that's the reason it's coming. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. So every time somebody enters, if I don't admit them, that uh, this thing will never pop up, will never go. Yeah. If a house is full, naturally it remains there. They yeah. keep trying in the waiting room. No, that, that is the thing. No. In between, uh, of course, you are the co-host, so that will appear on the screen. The rest of the control is with uh, Professor Santunusas. We, we need not to. So number 31 is rising now, uh, three minutes pass. Sharp at 10, five will start without further delay. It's fantastic. fantastic.
Let's get six. <clears throat> Some problem with the uh, audio system from yesterday. Okay. Uh, unless until I plug in this uh, uh, ear, uh, earphone, I can hear you all, but you cannot hear me. That that. Yeah, situation. that's what yesterday we in the inaugural session we could see that. Yeah, yeah. It is. It was a common problem for most of us, uh, and. Uh, it is uh, no shortcoming with uh, uh, Zoom nowadays. The open mic earlier it was taking uh, no, but, but it goes very feeble, uh, not audible without a headphone. So let us start, sir. Fine, sir. Take off. So my voice is okay, or uh, pitching too much, or I have to reduce the voice. It is perfect. It's perfect. Okay, hope, hope uh, other end uh, of uh, Karnataka, Dr. Kulkarni, how do you feel? His voice is okay now? Dr. Kulkarni? Sir? Uh, my voice is okay, sir, or it's too much, or I have to lower my voice? No, 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 no. Better you increase, sir. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that... Uh, it is heard all over the world and more people enter quickly. <laughs> <laughs> then instead of hearing, they will put uh, like this, close their ears. <laughs> nice, sir. Otherwise, also you are professor. No? <laughs> to speak to the whole crowd, <laughs> you have to raise your voice at times. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, yes, sir. One, one. Uh, hope it is not recording. One submission. Uh, next, most of the things are getting into the uh, super speciality of sports training, uh, and so on and so forth. If any uh, uh, initial beats uh, are required about the science on which they are going to speak on the day two, a brief of a minute I can put in, and so that. Uh, uh, again, you are introducing the speakers, and they take over. That yes. Is, uh, so, Swiss, sir, I think uh, you have to keep the mic a little bit. Uh, your this who, thing, you who, are not actually audible. Who who is Mike? Lakshmisha or uh, yours? You no no no, sir. Lakshmi you. Sir. Acha. Is it okay now? Uh, no, uh, sir. I think both the speakers. Let me let me try to pull close to my yeah voice. Is it okay? Hope yeah. hope now it is close to my yes. Yeah, perfect, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, how good morning to all of you. Yep. So, as we begin with the second day of eight days virtual international conference on yoga, health, fitness, and sports during COVID nineteen. So I'd like to first request our advisor. Mr. Y. S. Lakshmi Shahji, national coach, track and field athlete, retired chief coach, Sports Authority of India to give the first keynote remarks before we begin with our second day. So over mm -hmm. to you, Lakshmi sir. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Professor Santanu and uh, most uh, uh, respected uh, resource persons of the day two. Uh, today, uh, sure, we are going to get a lot of inputs regarding the allied sciences and it is directly influencing the, the sports performance. Uh, this today's uh, theme is uh, sports medicine and rehabilitation sciences. Uh, sports medicine is a branch of uh, medicine that deals with the physical fitness and treatment and the prevention of injuries related to sports and exercise. Sports medicine is a fast growing uh, healthcare field that focuses on the treatment of athletic injuries. Sports medicine healthcare providers help athletes and others physically active uh, patients improve their movement and performance. These professionals also work to prevent illness and injury 
and treat sports related injuries and also add on is the uh, awareness of doping uh, uh, the area so they are working in the in front to see that the country fly, flies higher in international arena and budding athletes go carefully without any major injuries in case of any breakdown to bring them back to the field at the earliest to see that they reach higher heights as quickly as possible is the responsibility on the shoulder of sports medicine experts. We are eager to hear a lot of uh, no, uh, great information, updates from these the scholarly speakers of the day. And uh, I pass uh, mouthpiece to Dr. Uh, Professor Shantanu for further. Professor yeah. Santanu, yeah, you yes. introduce the guests of the day. So we have for our first session for the day two, Dr. Kiran Kulkarniji. Dr. Kiran Kulkarni is from Darwat, Karnataka and hold MBBS degree from the Mysore Medical College, Mysore. Post-graduation in sports medicine from SAI, NIS Patiala and Gov Medical College, Patiala, Punjab. PG Diploma in Diet and Nutrition, IHCHNI. Completed his FIMS Advanced Team Physical Course from Beijing, China. He is listed on the World Anti-Doping Agency's Researchers Directory. He is a Fellow of Indian Association of Sports Medicine, got certified as FIFA or AFC and AFC Medical and Doping Control Officer in 2013, 15, 17, and 20. Completed his FIFA diploma in football medicine in November 2018. Experience or area of specialization. He is a consultant sports medicine specialist for last 21 years. Asian Football Confederation Medical and Doping Control Officer since 2013. BCCI International Doping Testing Management Sweden Certified Doping Control Officer since 2013. Indian Olympic Association, Indian Federation of Sports Medicine, Indian Association of Sports Medicine Certified DCO. Former national team doctor for Maine and under 23 football, All India Football Federation 2009 to 2015. National Senior Women Hockey Team during Argentina Chile Test Series 2009, National Men and Women Gymnastic GFI 1999 to 2008. An international sportsman himself, he has participated in sub junior, junior, and senior national gymnastic championship five times and All India Inter University Gymnastic Championship four times. He represented India in International Acrobatics Championship held in Burgas, Bulgaria in 1989. He represented Rotary National International District 3170 as a team member in group study exchange program of Rotary Foundation as a cultural peace and friendship ambassador to Buenos Aires, Argentina, 2004. Joint Secretary of Indian Society of Sports, Exercise and Medicine, former EC member of IASM and IFSM. In 2003, Dr. Kiran accompanied India men and women gymnastic team for the Asian Gymnastic Championship as team doctor held in Ganzhou, China. He worked as DCO during Afro-Asian Games and World Military Games in Hyderabad in 2005 and 6. In January 2009, he accompanied the national senior women hockey team to South Africa, Chile and Argentina as team doctor, under 23 men's national football team for the FC Challenge Cup in Colombo, Sri Lanka, in January 2010, he was appointed as the Venu Doping Control Manager at the 2010 Commonwealth Games, New Delhi. He was the team doctor for the senior national football team during the Asia Cup in January 11, 2011, Doha, Qatar and AFC Challenge Cup qualifiers at Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, March 2011. At present, he is the Asian Football Confederation Medical and Doping Control Officer only doctor from Karnataka and one amongst five in India. He had his AFC assignments as the chairman medical committee at AFC under 16 qualifiers in 2013 at Laos, AFC under 16 
finals in 2004 in Thailand and AFC under 16 qualifiers 2015 in Bangladesh. AFC under 19 in Bahrain, October 2016. AFC under 16 tournament medical officer 2017 in Iran. FIFA appointed him at the under 17 World Football World Cup at LOC Medical and Doping Control Officer in Goa, October 2017. He was in Indonesia for AFC Under-19 Finals, October 2018. As Tournament Medical Officer, Dr. Kiran was appointed Medical Officer at Under-16 AFC Football Finals held in Doha, Qatar, October 2019 and traveled to Colombo, Sri Lanka for the FIFA Doping Control Officer and AFC Medical Officer course 2018. Uh, 23 to 28 February 2020 representing India. Dr. Kiran has appointed as medical and doping control officer for the Asian Championship Leagues held in Doha, Qatar, November 18 to December 15, 2020. So just it is a brief profile of our allied speaker. So I would like to request our esteemed guest, esteemed resource person, in fact, we don't feel him like him as a guest. We feel him. He's one of our family members. And he is like, you no, know, he, Khyati and Lakshmi, sir, they are the three where we formed a coordinating team. And that's how you could see the shape of this program from simple Seshadipram group to national state, state to national. And later on, it become within span of 15 days, it become international. We really thank you, sir, for making this happening. I now on behalf of Seshadi from Group of Institution, a 91 plus year old organization, North Bangalore Science Forum, Department of Sports and Physical Education and Sports, Seshadi from First Grade College, and all the five universities from Ukraine, Indonesia, Ministry of Sports, India and Indonesia, and then Bangladesh, Sharjah, and all the associates and joint organizers from different parts of the country, Kira, Bharti, physical education. Then we have Bengaluru City University, Fit India, Physical Education Foundation of India, KSTA, Mentorix, Hover Robotics, Research Foundation, Rebok, and Mysore Vivekananda Yoga Center, University of Malaysia. All we request you to enchant us we have listened to you earlier also. We feel our audience will be really mesmerized to listen to you. And over to you, sir. Instead of taking much time, let us listen from you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I will share my screen. Sir, you have to go to slide mode. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, sir. Yes, beautiful. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Shantanu, Dr. Lakshmish, for this uh, second day's uh, program. And uh, thanks for your uh, wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, without wasting any time, I think we should uh, directly go into the topic. So I'll be speaking on uh, sports injuries prevention and management in this uh, uh, 45 minutes of my talk. And uh, definitely at the outset, 
like uh, i would like to thank the shashadit from uh, first grade college uh, managing uh, committee and uh, definitely all the uh, associated uh, universities and organizations who have really made this uh, webinar more colorful and uh, uh, it it is almost reaching the whole world and uh, uh, even like uh, i am joint secretary of indian society for sports and exercise medicine even i would like to uh, welcome all of you on behalf of uh, issem and uh, definitely i would agree at least half of the senior sports persons if you have met them if you would just ask them a question why have you uh, quit sports nearly 50 to 60% of all these uh, uh, sports persons would definitely tell you that we were injured during our sporting days we could not get proper treatment or rehabilitation for these injuries so finally we had to quit sports but it is not the same in today's world of sports as sports medicine and sports science has really come up so well and it is uh, the limit has been the sky so earlier it was like injuries are a part of the game and it was a common saying but in today's perspective is it true is always a question mark but studies also have shown that 50 to 70% of all sports injuries can be prevented and of course and it is needless to say that the sports physician the physios are the key players in this process along with the coach and the sports medicine team so here we need to know what is the sports medicine team and without the knowledge of what sports medicine team is it is uh, difficult to understand what really goes on so we have these uh, two teams team a and team b that team a is the injury management team and team b is the human performance team so in uh, the team a that is the injury management uh, team we have these sports physicians orthopedic surgeons gynecologists pediatricians etc along with them we have the sports physiotherapist dentist podiatrist nurses physician assistants athletic trainers and team b is a human performance team uh, where we have and these are the people who are behind the screen and they are the exercise physiologists massage therapists uh, therapists sports biomechanics orthotic specialists biochemists sports nutritionist and sports nutrition is also gaining a lot of movement these days and along with them we have the sports psychologists and sports psychiatry coaches themselves strength and conditioning experts and of course we have these uh, hydration experts also nowadays and all these come under the branches of sports medicine and all these eight branches of sports medicine are covered under this eight days of this uh, webinar so what are these branches so basically uh, the various branches are like sports anthropometry exercise physiology sports biotypology sports medical assessment and emergency medicine sports orthopedics pediatric sports medicine women and sports sports nutrition sports pharmacology and doping biomechanics kinesiology training methods sports physiotherapy geriatric sports disability sports therapeutic sports and again the latest one to add on is the recovery sports medicine so it encompass and encompasses the whole medical uh, subjects right from anatomy to obstetrics and gynecology and uh, including the total of the sports science subjects so now coming to the injuries so if you take into consideration about the sports injuries do you think this is a sports injury and you can see one of those spectators who has impaled himself on a fence while trying to watch a match so do we consider this as a sports injury because he has come to the venue this has to be a part because the doctor who is in charge of the stadium 
also has to look into such type of injuries so what about this so i will flip through a few slides where you can actually see this uh, catastrophic injuries and uh, his eye is being poked is it a sports injury is it uh, uh, like a attempted injury or something like that okay in weight lifting or uh, uh, you can see this in football the hyper extension of the knee joint uh, sorry uh, uh, rugby match again you can see an opponent poking into the eye of the player what about this uh, ice hockey match football and what about this uh, the match between uh, uh, tyson and evander holyfield where mike tyson bit the ear of uh, evander holyfield so do we consider this also as a sports injury so let's see what is an injury first so injury basically is a cellular damage and uh, local network of blood vessels are damaged and when these network of blood vessels are damaged of course the there is bleeding and when there is bleeding there is of course la lack of oxygenated blood which leads to cell death and injured soft tissue consists of dead cells extracellular substance and blood so when this happens we come like you know there are two types of uh, injuries the Class basic classification. That is, we have these uh, uh, macro trauma injuries and one is micro traumatic injuries. Like in my macro trauma, there is a specific single episode of trauma with acute tissue disruption. Whereas in micro trauma, it is like you also call it as a chronic or a overuse injury, which results when an anatomical structure is exposed to a low intensity, repetitive over a period of time, cumulative force. where the body's repetitive efforts are exceeded and local tissue breaks down so i have made another uh, classification like you know uh, there is one is acute second one is uh, chronic and third one is intentional injuries also here you can see uh, the intentional injuries where uh, athletes when they are losing they feel they they go beyond Uh, they are uh, psychic levels to injure the opponents and uh, definitely we have seen such type of injuries even in the uh, kabaddi uh, matches also so another injury classification again is acute sub acute and chronic injuries so here uh, acutes are rapid onset and uh, sub acute usually happens a period between uh, acute and chronic that is about uh, in between 4 to 6 uh, weeks apart then the chronic is slow in onset and uh, usually more than 10 to weeks post injury we call it as chronic injury so what are the five signs of inflammation when an injury happens we have these five signs all of them we need to listen to our body and these are the first five signs the body signals you that you need to take care one is the heat the second uh, signal is uh, redness around uh, around the injured part third is of course the pain because the chemicals are released by the dying cells which act on the nerve endings then we have this swelling because of the injury there is increased blood flow and extracellular uh, fluid and of course with all these three uh, four uh, events we have the fifth event where there is loss of movement okay so if at all we see all these five or a mixture of these then definitely we need to act upon it as an emergency so what are the common injury forms here i have classified both acute and chronic like we have these uh, uh, musculoskeletal injuries where musculoskeletal system involves the hard tissue which is uh, bone then we have the soft tissues like the tendons muscles cartilage is a soft bone then we have this joint capsule nerves ligaments bursas and of course we have this uh, non uh, musculoskeletal also basically we need to um, have a birds eye view on these also like a over training syndrome uh, and we have this female aphthatic triad also okay so these are the uh, common injury forms and when we have an injury it is equally important for the diagnosis of this injury so we need to talk to an athlete 
like how it happened when it happened what moment it happened so uh, irrespective of the sport we need to have a knowledge of each and every sport of how the injury happened at what moment it happened and only then we can come to a conclusion of what the injury is and along with that we need to observe the injury we need to touch and feel the injury we call it as a palpation then along with that we have to ask the athlete to move active movements and if he cannot perform active movements then we need to uh, do the passive movements assisted movements and check out what injury and even if he could do this then definitely why we need to ask him to do a few skill tests if he cannot perform then definitely uh, we can come to a conclusion of the final diagnosis with the conclusion or coming to a diagnosis and with this we can start injury prevent injury management and rehabilitation so this is an acute injury acute injury forms again uh, and uh, these are the different uh, uh, types of uh, fractures okay it happens in one go and again as i already said muscle ligament tendon injuries on the field are all acute injuries so how this acute injury happens is like they occur when there is sudden stress on the body and uh, usually we have uh, the causes as like when a player collides with an opponent or he falls down trips down slips skids okay and otherwise he is being stuck by an object like a football or a cricket ball or something like that or a hockey stick and if he falls from a height or at a speed when we see this in uh, pole vault long jump in gymnastics and in gymnastics we have seen real catastrophic injuries when athlete, when uh, gymnasts they have uh, uh, they have fell down on their uh, necks and broken their uh, cervical spine also so how do we prevent these uh, acute injuries so when we think about uh, preventing acute injuries we need to talk about a few things in this like uh, what is the level of physical fitness in an athlete whether the athlete has performed proper warm up or is he doing a proper warm down what are the safe playing conditions what about the temperatures what about the equipment the athlete is using what about the rules regulations and punishment and of course whether the athlete is wearing protective devices these are a few things which we need to look in and let's see what all comes in uh, all of this so uh, speaking about the physical fitness so we here we consider the general physical fitness as well as specific physical fitness and of course the conditioning programs which follow to have this uh, physical fitness ability so they are like you know the amount of strength endurance flexibility speed coordination these are the basic motor abilities and along with that we can classify physical fitness into two types that is uh, one is the general physical fitness and other one is the sports related physical fitness here in this talk i think uh, we will concentrate on the sports related physical fitness as again this sports related physical fitness has two uh, uh, types that is one is the health related physical fitness and another one the second uh, type is skill related physical fitness so again in health related fitness uh, physical fitness uh, components we have these five parts one is the cardio respiratory endurance that is your heart and lung machine how well it is performing then we have this muscular strength muscular endurance what is the body composition in body composition again we have we need to uh, check what what is the lean body mass what is the bone mass what is fan, fat mass and what is the uh, remainder and here again in body composition we see whether the athlete comes under the endomorphic type or a mesomorphic or an ectomorphic or a combination of all of these things so this is body composition and another most important very uh, uh, parameter is about the flexibility so these five are to be looked as a health related physical fitness component and when we come into more specific skill related physical fitness component we have along with the motor abilities we have the to measure up the speed 
power agility balance reaction time and coordination so these are the basic physical fitness uh, components we need to look into then what about uh, warming up and warming down most of us as soon as we enter the gym or as soon as we enter the stadium uh, or uh, before uh, as soon as we go to the badminton court we feel we are ready to but it is not so warming up is very important because proper warm up and cool down are a part of the game these things the warming up prepares the athlete psychologically that he is going to give certain amount of load to his body and which through warm up there is increase in body temperature increase heart rate and increased respiratory rate too and along with that there is increased range of movement of the joint increased flexibility of the muscles as well as the joints and of course there is an amount of lactic acid which has remained from the previous days uh, activity so with warming up even that little amount of lactic acid will also be washed away and of course we have this uh, uh, safe playing conditions in this we need to uh, look pro properly about the ground markings and all play fields should be free of potholes stones thorns and see to it that proper drinking water facilities are provided to the players as well as to the supporting staff and the spectators and definitely shades to the players are to be provided then we have these extremes of temperature we have where we have these uh, uh, events which take place in the afternoon and here we have this increase in body temperature because of the uh, climatic conditions which can lead to heat exhaustion and heat stroke and definitely heat stroke is an emergency where uh, the medical team uh, has to be uh, very prompt in treating, uh, treating these uh, uh, athletes who have heat stroke because if you don't treat them there they it will lead to uh, permanent brain damage and of course uh, uh, decrease uh, going to the other extremes of uh, uh, athletic activities or sporting activities uh, at a zero degrees temperature uh, which leads to frostbite frost nip etc so proper dress and athletic gear should be worn during training and competitions and what about the equipments these equipments that are used in daily practice training and competitions are to be checked for wear and tear oiling greasing and if damaged these equipments are to be promptly replaced mats and floorings are to be cleaned of blood sweat and dust regularly and we should not compromise on these uh, uh, equipments and uh, of course we have these rules regulations and punishment if i say uh, sir i did not know the uh, rules or regulation of this game then uh, uh, you will not be spared so rules and regulations of the game or sport are to be known by the athlete and it is mandatory penalty punishment and sanctions are necessary for unfair and foul play and definitely as i already told you there is no compromise so safety equipments and devices are to be worn at all times of the play helmets mouth guards chest and abdomen pads groin guards hand gloves thighs and shin pads and proper footwear should always be worn don't compromise on this and uh, how do we prevent this uh, chronic injury now again we have uh, now we just finished the acute injuries now uh, thinking about the chronic injuries we have this intrinsic that is inside that is inside our body and extrinsic is outside the body so here uh, in intrinsic uh, causes of prevention of injuries we have the history of prevent previous injury poor conditioning of an athlete muscle imbalances anatomical abnormalities nutritional factors and we have this growth factors so let's uh, again go into each one of these and uh, see what best can be done to prevent the intrinsic causes of injuries so history of previous injury is the most reliable predictor of injury is a previous injury itself so proper rehabilitation is necessary 
for return to play. So time has always been a constraint for the athlete, the coach, and the doctor because almost every day in our uh, uh, in our medical uh, rooms we see that athlete is coming, sir. When I can play? When I can go back to the sport? When I can start? These are the questions uh, we need to answer and return to play. And giving a certification that the athlete can return to play is very important. So along with that, we have the like unfit athletes are more likely to get injured, and off-season training program is very important for them. So again, as I said, again here the time is a constraint to athlete, coach, and most important to the sports medicine team who are treating them. So next is the muscle imbalance, most common in athletes, and a difference in between left and right or in between the agonist and antagonist muscles may cause injury. So what are the consequences like? You know, the first what happens is stresses to the underlying tissue. And next is it pulls parts of anatomy out of alignment and later on it interferes with foot strike. So leading to injuries of the lower limbs. So this is the reason why we need to check the muscle balances and if there is an imbalance, we need to correct it. And the next comes the anatomical abnormalities. In daily activities, they do not cause any problems, but over injuries may occur when these areas are repeatedly stressed. Example of these anatomical abnormalities being a flat foot uh, or a high arch foot, knock knees, bow legs, unequal leg length, and uh, during what we call it as talent identification, we all need to look into these anatomical abnormalities. And if the uh, person during a talent identification, during his anger age, so if at all we don't do this or don't check on these parameters, then later on, uh, they will definitely land up with injuries and see the amount of uh, uh, time which has been wasted on these uh, athletes because if an uh, athlete, if he has a flat foot, he cannot perform in uh, jumping sports. If he has a high arch foot, it is very difficult again for him to compete in jumping sports or, uh, or uh, high intensity uh, sprints or power activities. So we always, or if he has a knock knees, it is again difficult for him to uh, participate in uh, certain uh, uh, athletic activities or sporting activities. So we need to always put our thoughts on the anatomical abnormalities in the time of talent identification. Next is the nutritional factors. As I already told you that uh, sports nutrition uh, definitely has an important role. And in these nutritional factors, we have these uh, non-musculoskeletal problems, in the, especially in the females where we have this, uh, what we call it as a female athletic triad. So this female a triad is a triangle which has three sides and here again we have these three problems which, uh, uh, which are seen like a eating disorder or we have a with eating disorders uh, which uh, leads to menstrual irregularities in female athletes and this menstrual irregularities will uh, trickle down to stress fracture that is bone health. So eating disorder and bone health along with menstrual irregularities will definitely put a female athlete to her uh, room and she cannot perform. And of course, knowledge of uh, uh, balanced diet and nutrition supplements is also equally important. And we all, all already need to know, uh, we need to know that we have to avoid all the things. And just recently, about a week back, uh, you know what happened to this uh, Coca-Cola and uh, what uh, Ronaldo did in his uh, press conference. So coming to the sixth uh, factor, that is a growth factor, children are more susceptible than adults because of the reasons of the presence of growth cartilage and the growth itself. So in children, we always uh, need to be very important about the loading we give to them, the amount of uh, stress we put on them because all the training parameters are same, but we, we have to consider they are young adults or young children. So it is very uh, uh, important to see how much load are to be. If we do not consider 
the loading pattern on these children, then definitely they are going to land up with uh, growth uh, related problems like Oscoop Slatter's disease, Severs disease, epiphyseal injuries and fractures. So here we have this uh, uh, growth related intrinsic uh, factor that is you know, unique to the growing athlete. There is always a relation of these uh, muscle and tendon imbalance in these uh, because during periods of rapid growth and increase, they become increasingly susceptible to repetitive micro trauma and which leads to this injuries like uh, Oscoot sclaters and uh, Severs disease. So the extrinsic coming to the, these were all the intrinsic factors. Now coming to the extrinsic factors. Here we have these uh, uh, training errors taking into consideration of the intensity, duration, frequency. That's the uh, fit principle. Then inappropriate training structures and of course, inappropriate footwear. So what about these extrinsic causes like the training errors? Too much, too soon. Sudden increase in frequency, time, intensity, and duration. If we don't consider these parameters, then definitely the athlete is going to have these uh, injuries. Then uh, uh, the sports imposed deficiencies like we have is repetitive eccentric overload where if you consider this uh, uh, bowling in uh, and here we know we have this, uh, uh, I mean the, the follow through of these events, if we don't consider all this in the technicalities, then definitely the athlete is either going to suffer uh, throwers uh, elbow or a shoulder, or he may land up with a knee or a low back injury. So we need to be careful. Then uh, what about this uh, improper, uh, improper work structure? One of the most common reasons athletes get injured is because they do not prepare their bodies with a structured workout. That is scientific training protocols, micro, meso, and macro cycles, relaxation techniques, off-season uh, uh, training uh, programs, pre-competitive and competitive session, session workouts. So it is very important on the part of the coach and the support staff to look into these matters. Then we have improper footwear. Uh, prop, uh, footwear. Always invest, the athlete has to invest on proper training shoes. And it is like we call it as a Brahmastra of a athlete's wardrobe, important item of athlete's wardrobe. So let's see uh, what all uh, things are to be checked when you are uh, trying to buy or purchase a new uh, uh, shoe, because these are the uh, uh, various uh, factors you need to consider when you purchase uh, footwear and it is always better you purchase footwear in the evening time and this is the anatomy of the footwear and running shoe replacement excessively worn running shoes may lead to injury and you have to replace uh, these shoes every four to six hundred miles or uh, about uh, six to eight months so outsoles are made of durable components and are core indicators of remaining shoe life. And you, you have to check it. In most cases, the midsoles will wear out long before the outsoles, especially for heavy runners. So midsole materials last for approximately 800 to 1200 kilometers or about six to eight months, depending on the mileage and intensity of training. Running shoes may lose between 30 to 50% of their shock absorption capacity after about 800 kilometers of use. So it is always better to alternate between two pairs of running shoes and that will definitely extend the life of the shoes. So this was uh, during the Asian Cup football and I was the Indian national uh, team doctor. And uh, of course, coming to the controversies in uh, exercises and we always have two schools of thoughts where one school says you have to do it and the other school says that you should not do it. So athletes always, or the supporting staff, coach, and everybody always need to follow what the science is. And a little bit of common sense has to be applied when we perform uh, uh, such uh, uh, exercises, whether it should be done or it should not be done. 
like for example taking into consideration uh, what about uh, neck rotation are we do supposed to do neck rotation are we supposed to do trunk rotations what about knee rotations ankle rotations wrist rotation and actually here there is a, a slide in which a, a female athlete is doing a hurdle stretch and actually this is the right way of doing a hurdle stretch here she is trying to uh, stretch her adductor muscles and usually it is the other way around where we usually uh, twist our uh, hip joint uh, externally which is quite dangerous okay so if these are controversies in exercise are these exercises to be done or not to be done is very important and for that we need to know uh, or have a thorough knowledge of the types of joints and the movements of these joints so here as you see this uh, ang uh, uh, toddler is happily dancing around using all his uh, uh, joints in his body and if you see him whether he is uh, uh, he uh, is doing these movements like we need to consider a ball and a socket joint that is we have the shoulder and hip joint a hinge joint in our body is the elbow and knee joint pyot is the neck joint saddle joint is the thumb joint and the sternoclavicular uh, uh, joint we know and the gliding here we have in carpals and tarsal joints in your uh, carpals are in your wrist and tarsals are your ankle joints so general movements like adduction abduction flexion extension internal and external rotation circumduction they are all standard movements but when we consider the sporting movements so nowhere in our uh, sporting activities or in our uh, athletic activities or in competitive uh, sport activities there is neck rotation there is no trunk rotation there is no ankle rotation even a gymnast when she does a, a triple twist movement or when she does a 1020 movement on her uh, uh, foot which is supposed to be a c class uh, movement in a uh, floor exercise or on a balancing uh, uh, beam she rotates her body on the ball of the great toe and it is not the ankle joint which rotates okay so even when we rotate the rotational movements have to happen only in a joint which has a ball and a socket so there is a ball and there is a socket so in your body you have only two joints namely the shoulder joint and the hip joint the shoulder joint and the hip joint can actually be moved in 360 degrees but we rotate our neck joint we rotate our trunk we rotate our uh, knees okay this actually should not be done so that is the reason why we need to know or we should have a sound knowledge of the types of joints and these are the various uh, types of joints and the movements please always take into consideration talk to your uh, trainers talk to your coaches talk to your sports medicine doctor talk to your uh, physiotherapist whether these movements are to be done or not to be done and i am into the, that uh, school of thought where these movements should not be done so again we all we should always have a birds eye view on the risk factors like to prevent these uh, catastrophic injuries we need to know the risk factors which the athletes can like whether there is a history of smoking or alcoholism obesity family history of long term diseases like uh, diabetes or hypertension early deaths whether the athlete suffers or uh, during practice has chest pain or shortness of breath has palpitations whether he had past i mean like he had any blood clots infections fever unexplained weight loss foot and ankle sore which did not heal for a long time joint swelling unexplained joint swelling pain or trouble walking after a fall high injuries hernias hip surgery these are all the various risk factors which we also need to know to prevent injuries and now coming to the uh, what are the parameters we need to know about the injury management and this is a pyramid definitely you know we need to make an accurate and a patho anatomical diagnosis and along with this diagnosis we have to control the inflammation already i told you about the five uh, signs of uh, inflammation and we need to control them and what are the things we should add to promote healing whether rehabilitation or good 
uh, uh, nutritional support like i already mentioned about the sports nutrition and the nutritional supplements which these micronutrients help in promoting healing then what about the fitness exercises what are the exercises uh, the athlete has to uh, do and what about the control in abusing that is overtraining or overdoing these activities and of course finally activity participation is the ultimate goal of every injured athlete and for this uh, these are the few mnemonics and uh, never forget to contact your doctor okay so what are these we call it as a prismer so if you remember this prismer you need to uh, follow this uh, uh, protocol in controlling inflammation and that is you know always first thing is prevention is better than uh, cure so we need to protect the athlete we need to prevent these uh, both intrinsic and uh, extrinsic causes and along with that when there is an injury there is a rice protocol that is rest we need to ice the injured part and compress the injured part and you need to elevate and along with that medications are to be given and it is imperative now that don't give a medication all by yourself because you are not a qualified doctor so when a question of medications comes it is always better you go and contact your qualified medical doctor just uh, i have seen you know most of the time what happens is if the athlete is having um, fever or any problem we just casually say okay go and take a combiflam go and take paracetamol go and take diclofenac go and take an ibuprofen so this should actually not be done because at times there may be an allergic reaction uh, or uh, any problem the athlete may land up then who becomes responsible so we need to be very careful when you are talking about medications and along with that these the physiotherapeutic modalities or uh, various uh, modalities uh, which help in uh, the rehabilitation are to be applied and of course the rehabilitation so that the athlete goes back to his pre injury status levels so soft tissue injuries need peace and love so what is this peace and love okay so peace is we need again a protection elevate uh, the injured part avoid this non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs or the over counter uh, uh, medications because these are dangerous as i always uh, uh, said you know again we need to compress we need to educate the athlete about acute injuries chronic injuries and about the rehabilitation protocols also and again we need to talk about the nutrients which are uh, required in proper healing and of course this is pea ce peace and uh, now coming to uh, love that is we need to uh, talk to the uh, uh, trainer about what is the load to be given what is optimization uh, or, or what we call it as a, uh, like a optimum training protocols then uh, help in vascularization and of course we need to have a proper set of exercises which which again takes the athlete and of course even it is not only for athletes it is for even a recreational or a weekend warrior also who goes into exercise to be very careful so when an athlete is injured do no harm so no harm is what is h a r m h is don't apply heat no alcohol no running and massage is contraindicated don't do this when you are athlete is injured or you also have this injury so no heat no alcohol no running and no massage these are contraindicated so finally we need to stay away from doping drugs so this has been a very important uh, part and parcel of an athlete and all those who are concerned uh, the 360 degrees who revolve around the athlete taking into consideration the coach the support staff uh, the parents then the spectators the administration and of course the district associations and state association national and international association who all come into the ring so this is the uh, one of the high profile uh, cricketers even he is also like comes into a doping control room uh, and it it shows that we are all clean 
we go all of these athletes are clean and only 1% of the uh, athletes are uh, doped or they go for uh, this uh, uh, doping drugs to increase their performance so it is very important for all those who are concerned to know what these uh, uh, doping drugs are and we should say no to doping so especially uh, steroids are the highly abused uh, drugs in what we have seen in this uh, uh, pattern right for the past 20 25 years steroids have been abused and uh, steroid intake leads to soft tissue injuries especially the ligaments the tendon and muscle injuries and of course there is injury to bones also so always avoid or say no to drugs and of course this is a poster which uh, i have created and uh, the world anti doping agency has given me permission and they have approved this uh, uh, poster to be circulated as an educational uh, tool and kindly download this uh, uh, poster and uh, please uh, put this poster in your uh, on your notice board so that uh, athletes uh, can see this and uh, uh, they come to know why uh, steroids are uh, uh, banned in sports so injuries again as uh, uh, always uh, and i have uh, told you that they may strike you at any time so for those reasons we have to be prepared like this you know like uh, it's a bird's eye view, you know we need to uh, give in a thought uh, like this uh, small boy who is ready to um, go in for a game and who is uh, preparing himself uh, uh, to prevent these injuries as prevention is always better than cure and uh, uh, conclusion about these uh, injuries is a major obstacle to developing strategies for preventing injuries is the lack of epidemiological data on injury rates in most sports so this has been a obstacle and all those uh, uh, people who are involved in uh, the sports medicine and sports science subjects and all the researchers we need to again relook into these uh, uh, injury prevention uh, uh, data and uh, try to come up with uh, new data every year so that uh, most of these injuries can be prevented so again participation in sports itself you know like uh, uh, antonio samran who was uh, uh, the international olympic committee uh, past olympic committee president he said you know sports is friendship sports is health sports is education and it is life and of course sports brings the world together see in this uh, very webinar itself uh, so many countries um, uh, have joined hands and uh, i would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, of this uh, webinar that uh, it has brought in so many universities so many sporting people and all those you know, the universities and uh, and it has uh, you know like uh, uh, we need Uh, join hands in preventing these uh, uh, sports injuries and uh, thank you uh, thank you very much for uh, being patient to listen to my talk and uh, uh, before i finish my talk if you have any injuries any problems related to uh, sports injuries prevention of injuries doping drugs we have our organization this uh, indian uh, society Uh, of uh, sports and exercise uh, medicine icm i s s e m you can always uh, enter into this uh, website we have uh, qualified sports medicine doctors who are there for you 24 into 7 uh, throughout the country and wherever not it's only about uh, i am talking about india any part of this uh, world you can always contact us and as we always say world is one family uh, we are there to help you and see that we provide you uh, proper guidelines so that you can go back to your uh, uh, doctors or the sports science specialists in your own country in your own area if they are there we'll try to connect you and see that you prevent injuries and see that you have a proper uh, uh, guidance from us and uh, uh, so that uh, there is uh, the best in you and the best comes out in you so that you can give the best in your performance thank you thank you one and all
yes sir doctor uh thank you so much sir for your wonderful session and there is only a question what i could see uh no uh, that uh, how can be the doping stopped at grassroots levels yeah very important uh, question again so education is the main tool so we need to educate repeatedly to these uh, young athletes at a grassroots level that is as soon as they uh, uh, start or they come into the sporting field the coach himself who is the first contact of these young athletes uh, has to inform the athlete as well as the parents that uh, what are the consequences and all these things so education is the main tool to prevent doping at this grassroots level Uh, sir the next question from dwipen bashu what are the components of general fitness so general fitness of physical fitness as i told you we have these five motor abilities that is your strength then uh, endurance flexibility uh, coordination uh, these are the four five uh, uh, basic physical fitness uh, parameters and in these uh, basic physical uh, fitness components you know these have to be had by all of us whether you are an athlete or you are not an athlete yes sir so i think uh, you have touched the hearts of uh, all the speak or the participants here in the zoom as well as youtube so no uh, yeah one last question can we use flat footwear if not an athlete flat footwear yeah definitely uh, we also is call, uh, call it as a you know, platform uh, footwear maybe uh, slipper or even uh, shoes so the flat footwear or a platform footwear is uh, are those which do not have a heel usually most of this footwear have a heel heel lift what we call it as a heel lift so we have about half a inch or 1 inch uh, heel support or we have what we call it as stilettos where women wear where we have 2 inches 3 inches 4 inches also so these are to be avoided so it is always better to wear this uh, uh, flat footwear for especially for non athlete i mean athletes or non athletes uh from john peter there is a question i wish to know more about lactic acid if there is a book let us know lactic acid the accumulation of lactic acid in the muscles frequently you know like we are going into the physiology of uh, uh, training that we have three types of training one is the anaerobic training then we have this uh, intermediate training and when and that is the uh, lactic acid training method that is the second one and the third uh, training uh, method is our training protocol is aerobic uh, training where in anaerobic training all those activities which take place between 8 to 10 seconds so all these power sports come in this then intermediate activities the lactic acid activity where we have all those uh, activities which uh, take place more than 20 seconds to about 2 to 3 minutes up to 4 minutes then beyond 3 to 4 minutes we have this uh, aerobic activities where we are uh, in which uh, we have this uh, intermediate uh, uh, events like uh, after uh, we have this uh, 200 meters 400 meters and all those activities and these are uh, team activities where uh, we have this football hockey and all those things so when we consider this uh, uh, intermediate sports lactic acid so basically we think that lactic acid is a uh, waste product but lactic acid actually is not a waste product so we have these cycles in physiology i mean in our body where lactic acid is driven into the mitochondria to again produce energy okay so this is how uh, uh, the training protocol takes place and those coaches and those trainers who master in these training uh, three training protocols which i said is uh, anaerobic intermediate and aerobic he becomes a uh, master in training protocols so here it is like you know a power athlete doing uh, mm, uh, a training what a uh, long distance uh, uh, athlete is doing or a long distance athlete does a training protocol of what a power athlete does so this is not the uh, training protocol which has to happen so 
training protocol has to be individualized for what uh, sports the athlete is involved whether he is a power athlete or the other part whether is he is a um, endurance athlete or he is a intermediate so this is the thing and lactic acid is a intermediate it's not a, uh, it uh, in, in the power actually in the power activities lactic acid output is highest and once lactic acid uh, starts accumulating we call it as obla onset of blood lactic acid accumulation once it start accumulating in your uh, uh, blood and your muscles then that is the peak performance there the exercise stops okay i think uh, uh, with this uh, um, uh, brief uh, uh, explanation uh, you must be satisfied professor yes sir thank you so so much for your wonderful talk and uh, really whatever the uh, remaining talks are there we may you know take it post uh, session or we'll mail you so that the answer can be conveyed to our esteemed delegates on view of seeing the time uh, you know it's already 11 11 uh, what we can do as we thank you wholeheartedly on behalf of all the organizers joint collaborators and our advisors and sushadi from group of institution for being the first speaker to agree for this 8 days virtual international conference when it was just a college level program you have accepted and from there we have spread our wings and reach the international arena so i wholeheartedly thank you from my bottom of my heart and as we have discussed yesterday that definitely will take it forward it is not just a beginning and end it is just a first step or the first pebble to make the road ahead for all the young budding either the sports person or anybody else who can take because health lactic acid and all those whatever we do even we also teach them the same we can collaborate together and we can think for the better future thank you sir see you soon Take care, sir. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Jai Hind, sir. Thank you. Now I request uh, our next esteemed speaker, Alexander Krastulis. Yes. So, I would like to introduce. and i feel proud that i am going to introduce one of the prophetic coach who has been working in india and abroad and many countries so professor honorary alexander krastulwick he has done his phd and currently working in school of health sciences university science malaysia he is an elms high performance sports consultant for sports authority of gujarat india he is vice president asia international physical activity projects ipf he is a director exercise and sports science international consultant c e s s i c o m so alexander is a professor in the exercise his areas of expertise cover training and exercise methodology talent recognition and development performance analysis and coaching sciences teaching experience includes the kiev state institute of physical culture as a lecturer senior lecturer and an associate professor from 1982 to 1993 his applied science experience in 1988 to 1990 charge of talent identification schemes and then 1993 to 2002 involved work with sports authority of india as training methods expert in and as sci coordinator of scientific support to the national teams in more than 10 different sports in preparation to 1994 1998 2002 asian and commonwealth games and 1996 and 2000 olympics He is an American Council on Exercise Certified Personal Trainer, Lifestyle and Weight Management Consultant, and Health Coach. He has been a recipient of 
Teaching Excellence Award in U USM, Malaysia in 2006, Best Paper Awards at the International Conferences in 2008 and 2013. He has authored more than 90 plus journal articles, five book chapters, and three books on exercise and sports training methodology. His membership in professional bodies includes European College of Sports Sciences, Asian Council of Exercise and Sports Sciences, and National Association for Physical Education and Sports Science of India. He is a PhD thesis external examiner for 12 universities from four countries. 2002 involved work with sports. Uh, uh, he is an associate editor, guest editor, and also a reviewer for many national and international scientific journals. So it's just a brief profile of Alexander, sir. So I request our Alexander, sir, who has agreed and he has been key person in connecting to many foreign universities and helping us to get many foreign speakers and make this a program, a international look and international standard. I request Alexander, sir, to enlighten us on optimizing injury management, interdisciplinary approach in action. Over to you, sir. One sec, sir. Yes, sir, it's done. It's back to, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you for unmuting me. Luckily, I could be seen. Otherwise, we could still negotiate. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the organizers of the conference uh, for uh, inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, secondly, I also want to uh, say thanks to the colleagues and friends of mine who actually agreed to contribute. That includes Prof. Olga Borisova from Ukraine and the Olympians from Ukraine. And uh, third of all, I <clears throat> have expressed that yesterday as well. I'm extremely happy to uh, see that uh, my good old friend, uh, Mr. Lakshmisha, is here ex-national coach retired and uh, senior coach Sai, very happy to, he, to see him around and uh, privileged to have worked with him. You will not believe it. Since 1988, we know each other. So that was my first visit to India and that's where we met in Bangalore in the great company of his. Uh, now Professor Gushan Kanna, uh, Dr. Majumdar and many others uh, who were then actually the pride and the uh, <clears throat> force behind Nataja Subash Southern Center in Bangalore and the campus on Mysore Road. So uh, with uh, having said that, let me put my timer on so that I'm not lost in time. Uh, <clears throat> My topic of presentation today is, although placed in uh, <clears throat> the section of sports medicine, it's actually a not a uh, physiotherapist or medical expert view on the situation. It is actually the endpoint user view. So as it was mentioned, I'm currently a high performance sports consultant for Sports Authority of Gujarat. And uh, I keep consulting other organizations as well. So for me, injury management is something which actually avoiding which or managing which, which is actually letting me deliver my job in the best possible way. Meaning to place the athlete back into training, to give a coach an opportunity to work with that athlete without fear, 
to actually let the athlete work without fear and without an op- possibility or reducing the possibility to actually <clears throat> uh, reduce the chances of uh, relapsing or chances of being re-injured. So from that point of view, I'm going to share with you a few interesting things which are uh, actually should be in place from the other community. And that is why other parts of the community, sporting community, that is why the title includes interdisciplinary approach. So when we say doctors should treat, physios should observe, coach should train, SNC trainer should provide strength and conditioning. It is all correct, but <clears throat> every job, although not directly related to injury, has to contribute to that management issue. And if everyone does contribute, then we are on the right path. And then we can actually ensure that critical number of training hours are not missed. Uh, that uh, at least is back to training as soon as possible. And coaches can do their best job, which they can and should. <clears throat> from this point of view and from that angle, let me share with you some presentation of mine. Now, you please need to enable my sharing screen. So it's already enabled, sir. It is not. It says host disabled participant screening sharing. So please, if you want to have a look at my presentation, you have to enable my screening, share screening function. It is off now. Done, sir. Done, sir. Thank you. All right, here is the topic of my today's presentation. And uh, as it is obvious from here, and you can see, I'm representing two organizations. One is my university, which is University of Science Malaysia. And uh, it's uh, among top three universities in the country. It's a research university. <clears throat> we are doing a lot of research, a lot of uh, studies. And of course, we do teaching, we do master's degree, bachelor's degree, PhD in sports science and exercise science. Another organization which I'm representing is obviously ELMS Sports Foundation, which has appointed me and I'm proudly consulting Sports Authority of Gujarat, particularly uh, Nadia Sports Academy. So the presentation today, as I already mentioned, will be kind of end point View user view. So what and how everyone can contribute to the uh, issue of optimizing injury management from various quarters. So the question, the first one which I want to address is actually to put the definitions front, not rather definitions, but positions first. That, okay, where are we? How do we address that issue of tackling injury management? Where are we now? How do we go about it? So uh, <clears throat> this is the continuum, which can be visualized uh, from the point of view of actually injury management. <clears throat> we all know that prevention is a key, all right? Prevention is in the good and able hands of physiotherapists, medical doctors. They ensure that the athletes who are joining whatever training program, be it sports for all or specialized schemes or elite athletes, they will be all, first of all, checked and we will talk about it. And injury prevention mechanisms should be in place. It is a well-known category these days known as prehab, prehabilitation. And then if, and in case of the injury has been taken place, 
we all know, and those are, of course, medical personnel and rehab specialists who are taking a good care of our athletes doing a rehab, rehabilitation, so that they can well quickly, on time, before time, and fully healed, will join the actual training process. What I'm going to talk today about is neither prevention nor rehabilitation, because I'm not a specialist in As it was mentioned, I'm a training methods expert. I'm a specialist in training methodology, in exercise prescription, in performance analysis. And typically, I'll be dealing with high-performance sports. However, uh, different categories of users or subjects or, or customers are also through uh, research, participating in exercise prescription program. So <clears throat> when I say avoidance, this is exactly what my major inputs today are about. How to avoid situation. So I will start addressing that issue from the coaches because it is my deep uh, conviction that coaches are the ones who kind of bear the most burdens in uh, delivering high performance. Of course, there will be administrators participating and aiding. There will be sports scientists participating and helping. Coaches, however, have to deliver the job. And they also have legal duties to their athletes. And coaches actually should do what? Number one, provide appropriate advice and guidance. Number two, not offer advice beyond their level of qualification. This is exactly I put in place for a simple reason. We quite often, some colleagues of mine, are indulging into advices which are beyond their qualification. Coaches should not do that. Everyone else should also avoid that. That is another reason why I'm putting that in place because, yes, I'm talking as a sports scientist, as someone having a degree in coaching, someone having a PhD in training methodology, someone qualified by American Council on Exercise as personal trainer and health coach. However, I will do my level best not to step into other scope of practice. And that is the reason why I will not go into prehabilitation and to rehabilitation specifically because this is beyond my qualification. However, I will talk about every issue on health and safety from every quarter which is delivering high performance on how to attempt optimizing those. So if you look at the prevention risks and risk certification, this is one simple kind of diagram explaining actually the logic of those prevention and what exactly coaches and other specialists could be useful in providing that advice. Number one, coupling small increases in training loads with a moderate chronic training load has been shown to be the safest combination. True, but the moment we start talking about performance and high performance sport, that may not be always doable because we have to deliver the medals, we have to deliver the performance. So that is why the progression may not be that smooth and that simple as it may be in exercise prescription. Number two, minimize the week-to-week -week changes. Spikes in training, loads precede, precede injury and on athletes is at risk for up to one month after a spike. That is also fitting into the category, which I used to say that, look, we all kind of came across once in a while the topics or the posters like, okay, myth and truth about certain things. And then it is portrayed as myth or it is portrayed as truth. I have to tell you one simple thing, which most of you already know. The same thing can be true and false, depending on what caliber of athletes you're talking about. So if you're talking elite athlete, something which may be true may not be true for beginners or for sports for all. Same thing, something which is true for sports for all may not be true for high performance sports. That is why we have to be very careful in actually 
elaborating or assessing which level we are talking about. So number two, for instance, minimize the week to week changes. Yeah, okay, that may be true for kids who are 12 to 14 years of age, but it may not be true about elite athletes and elite performers. We have to play all the things there. Number three, a ceiling effect is observed where accumulated training across a week or month is greater than a threshold that is associated with increased injury of risk. Again, it's a kind of 50-50 statement because maybe true again for beginners, but this is not exactly what we are doing with the lead athlete. Yeah, there should be some threshold which we are supposed not to cross, but we are also supposed to very scientifically and critically approach it and tackle it and play all the tricks which we can and should play with things known as progression, right? So that is something which has to be observed. Number four, training on moderate workloads is predictive, protective. In football, some athletes have a relative underloading of external loads prior to injury. Can be observed in fringe and non-selected players accumulating lower training volumes. True, that is none of my job. This is a job of the doctors. They are the best to comment on that. Careful load management need to be taken off, I mean, after lighter weeks, particularly non-selected players, to ensure that athletes do not increase their risk of injury when returning to higher loads. True, rehabilitation, none of my business. Six, avoiding inconsistent boom-bust workload patterns. High-intensity training is a risk factor for overuse injuries. That is correct. But again, we need to observe all the safety issues, all the safety measures, which I'm going to talk about today, in order to have the both safety and top performance. We have to ensure training loads are pro 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 proportionate to the workload demands of a sport. Yeah, depends on the demand, depends on the demands. If a demand is a gold medal in the Olympics, we have to do whatever we can. Both intensive camp based training and congested fixtures have been associated with very high injury incidents. True. But again, we need to navigate through those situations. And I will share some ways of doing that with you today, guys. Monitor the athlete throughout the, tele, the latest period, the, the latent period of injury. Reduce the week to week change and the magnitude of the acute chronic workload ratio to minimize the risk in this period. Naturally, those will be discussed between coaches, scientists, medical personnel, and the best decision in view of achieving high performance will and should definitely be taken. Now let's have a look on the concept of that safety and practitioner look. Now, now this is the way I'm looking at the situation that we do have actually conceptual considerations related to three major domains. One will be pre-practice, another one will be practice, and the third one is actually performance. So let's one by one, step by step, have a look what is important here and why. When we talk pre-practice, of course, we talk medical clearance, we are talking verbal information, we are talking modeling, we are talking facility and equipment. Everything has to be adjusted to the level of our athlete, whether it is a lead athlete, whether it is a beginner, or it's a mid-level somewhere. Let's have a look. How is it supposed to be tackled? First of all, pre-participation pre screening. Yeah, absolutely. So medical is clearance is compulsory. And without that clearance, we should not even think of providing any particular training loads to the athlete. But that is unfortunately not what is happening, what is happening in realistic life. I'll give you a few examples without naming names and organizations, but Imagine we are receiving a newly selected kids to the academy. And those kids were selected through participation in certain competitions. They are the winners, the medal winners, the hopefuls. We are to admit them into training. Now, none of them is arriving with a medical clearance certificate. Neither that 
clearance certificate is available, nor the certificate of his clearance for participation in competition is available. Now, if I'm a high performance sports consultant, what do I do? I say, no, the kids are not allowed to start practicing without being certified and cleared. And the coaches and the participants say, oh, come on, man. They have just came from the competition. I said, whatever was there, if you can show me the competition clearance, which is valid for three to six months, I will say, fine. And that competition clearance will be good enough for me or should be good enough for physios, doctors, whosoever is involved in the academy to say, fine, and to clear that kid for a training session. However, if that clearance is not available, then we have to do that. Now, who's going to fund that? Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to recover the time which will be lost until and unless that will be done? So this seemingly very simple thing is quite often critical. And we should not compromise on that. And then obviously we have to repeat that clearance once in a while, whatever medical people will tell us and advise us, to keep those kids safe, sound, and injury-free. What's next? We do practice all sorts of assessments before even exposing our newly selected athletes to strength and conditioning session. Same very reason. It is no different from specific training. It is very much stressful. It carries a lot of load. And we actually in the academy there in Gujarat introduced our own kind of system of preliminary clearances. So before a kid is cleared for strength and conditioning, he should be cleared by, apart from medical clearance. Medical clearance goes number one. Second, physiotherapy assessment. Why? To see the stability, to see the mobility, to see if there are asymmetries which may be detrimental, which may result one way or another in injury or, or something. Then only we give the clearance for athletes to join strength and conditioning session. That is our level of defense number two. Number three, safe sports environment. Of course, we have to make sure that environment is safe by ensuring equipment is not broken, there is no uneven surfaces or sharp rubbish, the child plays sports that suit their size, age, and ability. That is important. I will elaborate on that in the next slide. They don't stay too long in cold water or hot sun. They wear clothes suited for the environment. And they, if needed, use modified and adaptive equipment. What is it all about, you can say? Now, ask yourself a question. If you are letting a kid of 12 years of age or something into the basketball hole, give him a full big basketball and ask him to shoot as much kind of free throws or whatever that kid can do. I repeat, if that kid can be 11 or 12 years of age, it could be not that tall be yet as basketball is supposed to be. Same in tennis, same in volleyball, same in many other sports. So for that very reason, modified equipment, as you can see here, can help younger athletes' mechanics. Why is it important? Check this out. When we teach the skill to a kid, it has to be perfect skill. We cannot teach someone a wrong or like, you know, faulty skill. Because if we do, then we are in trouble. We have to repeat, we have to reteach. And teaching again is way much more complicated than teaching originally a correct skill. So to avoid that, this is an example of what, for instance, uh, uh, International Tennis Federation is, is doing by approving tennis balls of different color and obviously different bounds. How is it important? Check it out. If you're talking about 19-year-old athlete who is like 170 centimeters tall, his bounds will be roughly within the range of 135, 147, standard tennis ball, the yellow color one. Now imagine if the same ball is played with a girl of 10 years or boy of eight or six year old kid, how that kid is supposed to tackle that ball and that bounce? 
and the speed. For that reason, there are green balls introduced, giving you a bounce of 120 to 135 with the average height of a player roughly 140. The orange balls bouncing about 105 to 120, slower definitely for a kid who is like 127 to 130 centimeters of height. And eventually red ball bouncing 85 to 105 centimeters. And a kid who is only just 117 centimeters tall can still play that ball with absolutely right mechanics. This is a key word. We are teaching a kid the right skill from the very beginning. We're not destroying his skill by offering him something which is not up to his size and up to his kind of quality. All right. So that is about equipment. Sorry, I just missed my link. Getting back into the next level or the next kind of cluster practice. There are many things in here which are already known to you. I'm not going to talk about warm up. Uh, everyone is aware of that. I'm not wasting your time on that. I'm not wasting your time on cooling down. I'm not wasting your time on hydration. I will spend some time explaining and elaborating on two issues, practice organization and instructions. Let's have a look. What are the important points here? Okay. Now, number, okay, practice organization. This is one of the issues which not many people talk about, but which everyone is suffering. Trust me on that. When we deal with sports academies or with sports schools, we are mostly facing something like that. Overcrowded facility, a lot of athletes, not enough coaches, not enough equipment, and many, many other things. So that is why. Critical is number of athletes. Number of coaches is also critical. Number of sports scientists is critical. And number of supporting staff is also critical. Why? Because these four are actually producing another three critically important variable. One is coach to athlete ratio, meaning how many coaches are there for 10 athletes? Or how many athletes are there for one coach? Imagine if that is 10. It's a great thing. What if those are 30? Now, what quality of instruction, what quality of supervision the coach can provide if that is the situation? It's a problem. It's a big one. Athlete to facility ratio. Now, what or how many kids that gym or this hall, looks like a wrestling hall, is supposed to accommodate to make it safe to practice? to avoid clashes, to avoid injury, to avoid overcrowding, because a lot of injuries are happening just because of that. So, athlete to facility ratio, athlete to sports scientist ratio, like how many physios are there per 10 athletes? Or like you have one physio for 100, and that is typical ratio. Is that what we are looking at in high performance sport? No, we have to get it changed. And done. Basic conditioning safety considerations. <clears throat> now, I will talk this time around in a few slides. Basic conditioning, specific conditioning, specific skills. Every one of those clusters have different kind of requirements. And we as coaches, scientists, managers, consultants have to observe that. The first thing to do, group homogeneity. What is it about? Reasonably simple. You cannot have in one group everyone starting 12 and finishing 25. Starting novice and finishing with Asian Games medalist. You should not keep them together as a coach. You should not allow it as a scientist. Because if the group, group is homogeneous, number one, they're not giving equal attention. Number two, they are distracted because juniors are supposed to do less, less loads than seniors. And skills is also involved, and that is important. Not to mix those in one group is not a good idea. Number two, <clears throat> exercise technique. Now, we are talking basic conditioning. Some of you will say, oh, what are you talking about? What is exercise technique? Oh, come on. The moment you start talking about heavy weights, 
you need to make sure that your athletes know exactly what to do and how to do. That is what exercise skill is about. They need to know how to do squat, how to do bench press. Every single exercise skill has to be learned properly. That is a key to safe practice. Exercise selection. I will talk about it next slide. Spotting technique. Of course, next slide as well. Breathing technique. Breathing technique is not there in the slides. We need to teach our athletes how to breathe properly. We are talking yoga. Everyone says yoga is important. Breathing is important. Oh, okay. No one is arguing about that. However, breathing in the gym or breathing during exercising is also very important. There are rules to follow. And those rules have to be observed and taught. So let's have a look. What is it we are talking about when exercise technique is important? Stability, balance, and skill. Now, if you see someone in the gym doing bench press and kind of lifting his feet onto the bench, thinking that that helps to develop balance, that is a big mistake and a violation of safety rules. <clears throat> if the weight is reasonably heavy, every loss of balance is injurious. Now, the legs are basically the only two supporting kind of points which are holding your body balanced. If the bar goes down right, you are actually countering with the right leg. Left, left leg. Imagine if both legs are lifted to the bench. Boom, you're done. You're injured. Your athlete is injured. That is not what you want. So that is why certain rules have to be observed. Instability in balance, and of course, in the skill. Now, the next point here is exercise selection. So how do you do that? Resistance training in basic conditioning has a plenty, like myriads of exercises. They are all different, different kind of muscle groups, different approaches, different complexity. And that should be one of the major issues which a coach and scientist should follow. The easiest ones are exercises with own body weight. They are safest, easiest to talk, to teach, and every single sort of round of conditioning should begin with something like that. Followed then by what? Machine exercise. Please do not let your athlete catch and hold free weights right away. No. Free weights are the most injurious ones. And skills is important. And because of skills, they are injurious because you have to teach it. You have to develop certain muscle coordination for that. Machines are much safer. So own weight exercise is the safest. Machines, second safest. Then only when you mastered one and two, you can proceed with your athletes to free weight exercises. Please do not believe anyone who say, okay, straight away, free weights. No, big no. Even when the athletes reach the let that stage of free weight exercises, they still have options like multi exercise, multi muscle exercise, when many muscles are involved, many joints are involved, and then isolated exercises. Multi muscle exercises are safer, they are more basic, they have to be mastered first before getting into isolated muscle exercise. Now that will also help to avoid injuries and help to reach those isolated muscle exercises in the best possible shape that the athlete can possibly be. Spotting technique. The moment you reach free weights, heavy weights, the moment you start working on maximum strength and your RAM reaches less than eight, so the, weighter, the weight is heavier, the density is higher, RAM, smaller number. RM6, RM5, RM4, meaning the weights are only can be lifted four, five, or six times. And that is also very tricky. Hypertrophy and maximum strength is typically developed to the point of, okay, muscle hypertrophy, maximum strength is not. Hypertrophy is to be developed up to the point of muscle failure. Muscle failure is when your muscle cannot contract any single time more. Now, when you do something like, uh, you know, six, no, eight to 12 RM, 
that muscle failure is easily predictable. You can still say, fine, I can still do three set, I mean, three more reps. When RM goes down and intensity up, that becomes less and less predictable. I can predict like another three repetitions I can do with RM12. I cannot predict rightly number of reps left with me in my muscle if I do RM4. I feel that I can still do another two and the very next repetition, my muscle fails. I cannot push it any longer. That is why we need spotting. That is why we need proper spotting technique so that everyone is safe, both skill-wise and also lifting the weight <clears throat> and putting it down. The next level, specific conditioning. What is specific conditioning? See, when we finish basic conditioning and we say, fine, the gym issues are resolved, a person knows exactly what to do. Specific conditioning is something which coaches have to do. So they have to produce and improve on basic motor qualities based on what was done in basic conditioning. So they put specific exercising belonging to their own sport. Basic conditioning is sportless. It's kind of no gender, no sport. Yeah, gender is there, of course. <laughs> specific conditioning is sport belonging to. That is why you have to convert whatever has been developed in basic conditioning into specific how. Here are some of the examples. Picking right implement. I'll explain in the next slide. Picking right, part, right sparring partners. We'll give you a specific slide. Observing overload. Yeah, that we come to the point that it has to be observed. You should not actually practice power, for instance, or speed with an athlete who is not fully recovered. Same goes with maximum strength. If your muscle has not regained the full load of ATP PC, you will not be able to produce a maximum strength effort. So you have to wait. Avoid overreaching. Our athletes and many coaches are sometimes thinking, ha, I can do more. Oh, come on, of course you can do more, but it's not the right time to do more. If you have been told to do that many exactly, to do it, it's done. Do not attempt any more, even if you think, even if you feel, and even if you know you can do more. Please follow the training program. Overreaching is an enemy. And of course, observing level of fatigue. You're getting tired, your muscles are getting kind of clumsy, lose, don't continue. You may get injured. So now let's have a look at right implement and right sparring partners. I'm sharing a few things with you, like a few tricks of high performance sports here. May not be well taken for novices, however. What are we talking about right implement? See here example of hammers. This is a competition hammer for men, 726, uh, women, and the light ones. And any one of those can be used in training. How? You can say, why not the full implement? Because the simple logic, the heavier the implement, the more strength component is in the throw. The lighter the implement, the less strength component is in the throw, the more speed component is there. So that is why throwers typically fluctuate and kind of you know, navigate between those. They want higher speed, they go lighter. They want bigger strength, they go heavier. And they have to be very particular with that because that has to be also clubbed with the proper coordination and with the proper skill. Because if the skill is not there, there may be a trouble. So if you see at least practicing with different various weights, sort of various weights of even specific implement, it is a specific condition going on. Not basic. It's specific skill being improved. It's specific strength being improved. Same thing happens, for instance, in combat sports. Uh, put boxing aside. We don't encourage heavier boxers fighting with the lighter one. But when we talk wrestling, when we talk uh, judo, when we talk taekwondo as well, we can practice that. If you have an athlete of 67 kilo of weight, and you want specific strength to be developed in this guy, you use the heavier partner. 
then the strength component will be improving. You want improved speed component, go lighter. So if you pair someone of 67 and 63 kilograms together, make sure that what is actually happening, you're providing 67 kilo athlete to develop speed. At the same time, in the same bout, in the same pair, you are offering a 63 kilogram athlete to improve his or her strength. This is exactly what is happening. And this is what coaches are actually playing and navigating throughout the weights to achieve that objective. So this is also has to be tackled with care because that can be also potentially jury. Specific skills. So when you're done with general conditioning, specific conditioning, you move to skills and you try to bring it as close to competitive demands as possible. You have to also observe certain things as a coach, as a scientist. Make sure your sporting equipment that includes shoes is well maintained. Wear appropriate protective gear. Make sure the playing environment is well lit and appropriate for the sport in question. Enforce safety rules. Stop exercising immediately if you are injured and seek medical advice before starting to exercise again. Those are the things which should be incorporated in the mind of every athlete. Not necessarily, I mean, of course, into the mind of coaches as well. Athletes sometimes tend to not disclose their worries and their problems, neither to coaches nor to scientists. Why? Coaches may say, okay, sorry, you're not selected for the next competition, or you will be missing some kind of training. And this is what kind of athletes are afraid of. They may not even disclose to the coach or to the, to the doctor. Why? Because they may fear that the doctor will share that information with the coach. And although general rule is that the kind of medical information should be actually kind of uh, protected and not disclosed, not in sport. If I am a team doctor and I have a player who is nursing undisclosed injury and suddenly I know about it, I have to talk to the coach because not knowing that or not having that information available with the coach coach can make a wrong selection decision. And you don't want to play with that. Trust me on that. So it has to be properly observed. And non-disclosure is a difficult and controversial, very controversial thing. Instruction. Of course, of course, good is supposed to be instructed. Coaches supposed to be good at instruction. Children are supposed to be understanding everything. Clarity of instruction is important. Professionalism of instruction is important. Even the language. See, I kind of told you not once that I, and thank you for a nice introduction from uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Santana, uh, Santana Das. Yes, we are in Gujarat, they are in the academy. Luckily, I don't give instructions to athletes, coaches do. Because sometimes, and not only in India, in Malaysia where I'm now, the communication between coaches and athletes, particularly between foreign coaches and athletes, is realistically very serious. And quite often, if you are not sure that the kids have understood the instruction, don't do whatever you have to do. Because wrongly understood instruction could be leading to injuries, and that is not what we want. So I'm bringing you back to the actual, uh, the third level performance. And of course, I will give a little bit of venue safety, tempering, max uh, effort, anxiety, and fair play. But I will also pay some attention to injury management. So risk assessment. You see, for instance, if you talk about venue, you have to assess it. For instance, football, playing conditions, Actions of players, dangerous tackles, accidental collisions, which could cause injuries, a shot which could damage third part property. This is also risk management. So before pro 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 kind of getting into some sort of training or competing that has to be done well in advance, the potential for a goal post goal post to collapse. 
It could be. Goalkeepers are hanging sometimes on the goalpost. Kind of, kind of strikers sometimes are hitting the goalpost. It happens. So you have to make sure this ball is won. The potential for a player to collide with or trip over a goalpost should not happen. Inappropriate footwear, example, boots not having the right stud, inadequate protective equipment, players not wearing shin pads, for instance, jewelry, which could cause injury to the wearer or others, which is also important. Flag post being too close to the pitch on the halfway line and the five feet foot high or the pointed top. These are all the points which have to be observed in that interdisciplinary approach to make sure that nothing happens which can lead to kind of injury. Next, preventing and managing injuries. Of course, I will not pay more attention to what has been mentioned in that box of forms because those are known factors. Let me share with you some uh, approaches which has been actually used in the European Union uh, in actually preventing and managing injuries. All right, let's have a look. Closer look to the reasons of being injured. Most sports injuries occur due to the following reasons. Lack of education and awareness. Surprisingly, it is true about safety precautions and potential injuries. Inappropriate or lack of equipment. It is true too. Poorly conditioned players, absolutely. And that is one of the reasons why I was spending a good deal of time actually sharing with you that information on how to tackle general conditioning and specific conditioning, because poorly conditioned players quite often get injured more than others. Overuse injuries. So with having that in mind, we need to kind of look at the situation, answering simple questions. Why the angle twist in or because of the technique, because of muscles being insufficiently kind of developed, or as I was mentioning today as well, and what we are actually assessing pre-practice, like asymmetrically developed muscles. Range of motion, balance. So then it needs to be known, explained, and that covers actually for the first reason, like of education and awareness. Then improve the how by using the correct technique to carry out exercise, which actually provide the safety and correct movement to avoid actually slips, to avoid misplacement, and to avoid actually the uh, uh, kind of injury from happening and uh, pointing in the same direction as this is in this particular case. Now, there are many other factors which are actually impacting the potential occurrence of injury. See, injury is not necessarily something which, boom, it happened. No, the management of injury is much more complicated thing. And I'm just approaching you know, the guidelines which I was just sharing, telling you to share about the sharing with you of European Union countries. Now, there are internal or intrinsic factors or risk factors that are part of at least characteristics, such as age, gender, level of fitness, playing skills, and so on and so on, which makes them actually predisposed to injury, intrinsic, belonging to an athlete. And there are external factors also related to the environment and equipment attributes used while playing, and that makes them susceptible to injury. So these two kind of categories, predisposed, and susceptible can be tackled and should be tackled to reduce the predisposition of an athlete to be injured and to reduce susceptibility of injury by modifying and improving external factors. So what is it about? These factors often in combination, both internal and external, will determine whether a specific event will actually occur and specific event, meaning the event which may, but again important, may not lead to injury. So if an event is happening, it's not necessarily that injury also happens. And this is a critical point and a very important point in that management, which I am trying to 
get to closer to. So it may not occur and result in an injury, even in cases in which the cause of an injury appears to be very, very straightforward, such as direct kick to another player's leg. In reality, the cause may be more complex than that. And because of that, this is the example. Contributing factors could be leg pads that were inadequate in absorbing impact. Previous injuries sustained to the leg or lack of attention due to the fatigue in the final part of the game. So it's not necessarily that it was direct, tech, direct tackle which actually caused the injury. Look at how many factors are actually possibly contributing to that. So we have here what? Predisposed athletes, internal risk factor, age, gender, body composition, uh, examples, body weight, fat mass, B BMD, anthropometry, uh, health, examples, history, physical fitness, muscle strength, power, anatomy, alignment of, this, of the joint, skill level, and so on and so forth. These are the factors which are predisposing. Now, what else? What else is there? So then it goes into exposure to external risk factors. Those are internal. Exposure, human factors, protective equipment, helmet, shin guard, sport equipment, environment, weather, snow, ice, so and so and so. And then eventually, athlete is either susceptible or not. And then what happens? Inciting event, joint motion kinematics, playing situation, example, skills performed, training program, match schedule, which again, I repeat, may or may not, result in the injury. So everything, and that is why I was paying more attention to the beginning, that my main objective will be avoiding. So we are looking at every possibility on how to avoid an injury. And that is why it is actually important to know, to note that risk will change over time, not only because of external changes or internal, so say field conditions are changing, uh, fitness level is changing, improving, and the, the strength may increase, and technique improves over time. Susceptibility then to injury is reducing. And, however, repeated minor injuries may weaken the tissue and susceptibility to serious injury. So we have to look at each and every factor and look at it and consider how to remove it if possible. According to this moment model, the best way to prevent injury is to change or remove one or more risk factors. And in case a risk factor such as age cannot be modified, there are many others which can be actually modified and could be and should be targeted to choose the categories of athletes that are at risk. So now let's have a look. Very popular in the, in, in the European Union, Hudden intervention method. Prevention metrics relates to the two, whether the intervention is designed to avoid accidents to occur, like pre-crash measures, to avoid injury, all right, reduce the immediate severity of injury in case the accident happens, like crash measures, and eventually post-crash measures on how to minimize the consequences of a sustained injury. So pre-crash, crash, post-crash. Crash. And that is how the benefit of applying the headaches metrics to the prevention of sports injuries is to help to establish a comprehensive view of relevant measures to take in prevention accident to occur and then minimizing the severity respectively the outcome of injuries in case the accident occurred, in fact. So it helps to identify a multi-axial uh, strategy for prevention, thus, addressing multiple risk factors at the same time. So that's how it looks. We have phases, human equipment environment factors, pre-accident, accident prevention, injury event, injury prevention, post-accident event, injury treatment and rehab. So how human risk awareness helps strength training a lot. That's what I was explaining. Now, however, equipment is also important. Braces, 
proper footwear, playing self, I mean, field surface, environment, fair play rules, playing field management, safety rules, and so on and so forth. So, however, if these pre-accident situations were taken care of, then what happens? Injury event. If event is actually occurring. Now, pay attention, fall techniques. Judo, wrestling, taekwondo are working a lot, coaches and scientists, on developing fall techniques. So if an injury event actually had happened, a lot depends if the athlete can get rid of and avoid being injured by using either fall techniques or impact coping techniques that helps to avoid injury. And then equipment is also supposed to be there, skin guards, mouth protection, face guards, and so on. Eventually, if the injury actually pre-accident, accident, okay, injury happened, and it has been, unfortunately, happening. First aid training, compliance to return to play rules, first aid requirements, imagery, imagery, I mean, emergency equipment, rescue service, medical care, and so on and so forth. So that helps understanding how it has to be treated and tackled. Now, the simple matrix also applied here. Dividing the uh, reasons or causes into four different clusters. Training and physical preparation, balancing exercises, stabilization, strengthening, agility, things I've been mentioning today already. Technical and political approaches, fair play, coaches' education, behavior, rules modification, equipment and facilities, taping, orthosis, mouth guards, protectors, venues, shoes, medical and non-medical support, physiotherapy, pre-participation, examinations, medical screening, massage, psychological support, many other things in order to achieve one goal, protect, avoid. Now, particularly these times in the times of COVID, we are all facing SOPs, NOPs, EOPs. They were always existent. We were never paying attention actually to that. So you have to be now. Be aware of health and safety policies. So see COVID is sending us kind of a positive message. People learn your lessons, do your homework. So possess first aid kind of qualification if possible. First aid kit supposed to be there. Not empty, full stop. Have adequate insurance cover, adequate child protection certificate for the authority establishment you are working for. Be familiar with the facilities, SOPs, with it's like for start with normal operation procedure. See, we before SOPs, we, most of us were not even kind of thinking of NOPs, normal operating procedure. We call it sometimes SOPs, like standard operation procedures. Yes, we know about it. But there should be policies and procedure and minor incidents, such as recording incidents, accident forms, logs, and so on. Emergency, there should be emergency operated procedure. Trust me, not many people know about it, which actually has to be in place. Uh, like so it's case situations like fire, facility evacuation, ports, and so on. Seemingly simple things, please beware. And play safe. And on this, I would like to finish my Presentation, thank you for your attention. Thank you for sticking around. And uh, uh, that will be it. Back to the organizers. And uh, I still have some time. I guess you decide on the timeline if questions are there or not. I'm offing my timer. I'm all yours. Thank you for yeah. your attention. Thank you, Sus, for such a wonderful training module and how you had been working with Reliance and our own advisor, Lakshmish Ji. So it is always a pleasure listening to you. And I could see a few questions which I'll be posing you. All right. Uh, it's from Lakshmish sir himself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Your presentation yeah. pinned the minds and alerting accountability of everyone 360 degrees around an athlete to optimize the injury management. So it's not a question, it's a compliment. So I wanted to deliberately read that. Thank you, Lakshmi Zaji. Kind of you. Okay. <laughs> now the question. 
no questions. I, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I love compliments. I don't mind taking more if there are. <laughs> yes, I will. But the, I will. But, 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 the more, the, but the most valuable to me is from Lakshmi Zaji. Thank you so much. It's nice. nice. It was a wonderful presentation uh, from Kashmir. Uh, appreciation for you. From uh, Van Rosliezy from the same institute, Malaysia. Thank you, Prof. Van Rosli. And a few. Then, yes, from Claret Call Bangalore, very nice explanation. Yes, Tage uh, Tangyo from Naveen. Sir, I want to know difference between own weight training and free weight training and points to be considered while giving training or coaching to not free athletes? To not, not which athletes? Free. Knock free, knock knee athletes, knock knee. Ah, I see, okay. All right, the first question is kind of very simple. And uh, the difference is that the first category I was actually referring to are exercises with own body weight, like push-ups, pull-ups, dips, sit-ups, uh, modified push-ups, clap push-ups, uh, lounges, uh, jumps, hops, steps. Those all are actually exercises with own body weight. And exercises with free weights, of course, uh, those are with the dumbbells, barbells, typically dynamic exercises with the, which athletes are uh, actually kind of utilizing, uh, particularly during the uh, general phase of conditioning. The little bit of specific conditioning weights will also be there, but I am always convincing <clears throat> the strength and conditioning trainers that specific conditioning is none of their business in good meaning. They actually have to produce their foundation. <clears throat> and specific conditioning is the job of the coaches. Uh, but the coaches have to be, you know, intelligent, like Lakshmi Saji is, to understand that specific conditioning is not achieved through lifting weights. It is through doing the job on the pitch, on the track, with modifications, and the coaches are supposed to actually fix that. And that is the first part. As of the uh, knock knee, uh, I may not be the right person to actually address that issue. I was uh, like reiterating on that on a number of occasions right now because <coughs> knock knee is a condition which should be <coughs> rather tackled by physiotherapists and they will be the right people to to advise on that and there are a few tricks and uh, you know things which can be used in the gym but i repeat i will not actually i will try i mean prevent to avoid commenting on that ask your physios they will be better judges on that thank you Thank you, sir. The next question from Ganesh S. With fast, large number competitions, how to cope up with injuries as early as possible? Uh, see, the you may not be you may not like the answer. However, it will not be directly answering your question. But I will still try to uh, refer back to a few slides in my presentation where I was attempting to reiterate the point that prevention is a better idea. So look at basic conditioning as something which will keep you injury free. Look at specific conditioning as something which will keep you injury free. Look at specific skills and specific skill belonging to your sport as something which helps you. However, in the situation, if you try to stay exactly injury free. Again, look at how you can tackle it. Remove all the intrinsic factors or try tackling those. Try also removing the kind of the predisposition factors and in incitement factors. Like make sure everything fine is with equipment, everything. In case you still manage to get injured, 
Then again, I'm sorry, but that is not a question to me. <laughs> but it is a question of first aid. That's a question of applying proper rules and regulations. But one thing I can tell you for sure, please do not attempt uh, performing very frequently if you are inadequately fit. Participation in competitions are not adding to your fitness, neither to your general fitness nor to your specific fitness. It's the other way around. That is one of the reasons that people who are playing too many commercial tournaments and at least who are spending too much time, I don't blame them in earning money or earning qualification points. They typically will be prone to injuries if they are not spending enough time for strength and conditioning and for specific fitness. Thank you. Uh, sir, I would like to request you if you can stop the presentation so that we can see you uh, in a big screen. I cannot do it because it doesn't, my, it, there is no uh, functionality to that. It's uh, only new share. Ah, yeah, okay, I see it, sorry. Yeah, pardon. pardon. Thank you, thank you, thank, my, you. My, thank you. My fault. Thank you. So the next question from Amit Vadoria ji, how to prevent the bony problems in four to six year kids? Oh, again, you are talking something more specific, which is kind of beyond my area of expertise. Guys, I'm sorry for giving, not giving you the direct answers. Uh, the youngest kid I've ever dealt with in coaching was roughly about six years of age. And uh, please uh, forgive me for not giving again uh, the correct answer. That is the area of exercise prescription in children, which again, I may not be having enough uh, kind of qualification of. Because the simple issue which we are incorporating in the selection procedures when we even deal with someone six or seven years of age, we are actually uh, not, uh, what shall, how shall I put it? We are not uh, encouraging kids with uh, a certain disbalances and uh, uh, asymmetries. We are, sorry to say, we are not advising them to join high performance sport because eventually sooner or later those conditions will become a limiting factor. As of the question again, that is more to physios and doctors. Please remember I'm a training methods expert, performance analysis and uh, exercise prescription specialist, but not in children, uh, adults, elderly, uh, pregnant, postpartum women that I can address those issues, but uh, smaller kids, no. The pediatric exercise prescription is not mine. Sorry about that. Uh, I think, let me, one sec. Uh, Kiran sir, yes. Kiran uh, sir wants to. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Alexander. Good afternoon. Yeah, just uh, about uh, weight training myths. What is the right age to start weight training in children? Because uh, this has been a big debate. Wherever we go as a sports medicine doctors, it has always been one of the questions like uh, the parents, the people ask, what is the right age to start weight training for kids? All right. Thank you, doctor. It's a very good question. And uh, you are right. There is a, it has been a subject of debate for, for too long. And those debates uh, have been resolved, luckily, a few years ago. Uh, you can advise uh, to coaches asking this question and parents asking this question to actually uh, Google uh, the position statement of uh, American College of Sports Medicine on resistance training. And I think it actually happened already about like almost a decade ago. They put it in black and white that they are encouraging uh, parents, athletes, uh, subjects, participants, whosoever, to
to look at resistance training as a uh, intervention which eventually prevents you from getting injured. That is a quick and brief answer to the question. It should be encouraged. Number two part of the question, from what age? Age in this particular situation, surprisingly, also does not matter much. And why? Because I was actually showing this slide today in the presentation. Because there are many varieties of resistance training exercises. Resistance training covers everything. If you are asking a question about free weight, then the answer will be sorry. You should not, I mean, you should not, uh, you know, encourage doing that with, with younger kids. However, that sequence which I put on the slide begins with exercises with own weight. And that can be practiced at any age. At any age of a young kid, four, five, six, seven, doesn't matter. Exercises with free with, with own weight are harmless. They're helping a lot. And they are preparing a kid for the next possible use of exercises. Of course, there are exercises with uh, kind of rubber belts, with, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, small mats and balls, power exercises, jumps exercises, throws, throws, like bounces. There are plenty. So, mats and balls, no problem, age, no issue, lightweight, uh, expendable uh, rubber belts and, and uh, you know, kind of expanders, no issue of age. When this is mastered, please proceed with machines. Using training machines are safe. Try avoiding squat, try avoiding Kind of good morning. That is a problem in India. There's a one very famous exercise. Good morning. Surya Namaskar. Good morning. Good morning should be performed only with knees bent. Please don't keep your knees straight. Don't do good morning. This is injurious very much for the lower back. This is how you're getting your athletes injured. All right. So use machines as a next option. So machines can be used after exercises with own body weights are mastered. Uh, with, with rubber pools, please, that, balls, mats and balls. Machines is the next step. Free weights only after these two, three options are mastered. And I would say don't do free weights, particularly pressing spine, particularly uh, not earlier than at the age of 12. And also one more thing to, to remember that Kind of coaches sometimes think that they can in increase strength uh, through resistance training in younger ex younger athletes. It is actually not happening. It, it happens, but mechanism is different. Please remember that original initial improvements in strength are neuromuscular. Neuromuscular, when the, the, the muscle starts firing more, more uh, muscle fibers, the cro more cross bridges, uh, the agonistic antagonistic relationships improving. Hypertrophy in kids is not happening for a simple reason. There are no enough hormones and hormonal bases to, for muscle to grow. And that is why going for hypertrophy in kids who are not having enough testosterone is not a good idea. They will keep improving strength a bit because of the intramuscular coordination. But Hypertrophy will not be happening. And that is one more reason why not to go for maximum strength. They are not supposed to lift anything lower than 6RM. Anything kind of heavier than 6RM. So those are kind of two to three, four points which you have to, which you can actually deliver to coaches and uh, elaborate on that. But a resistance training in meaning of that resistance is not harmful at any age. You just have to specify which part of that resistance training to use. Exercises with bone body weight, exercises with uh, rubber belts and expendables, exercises with machines. Well, I mean, free weights, better not to practice with young kids. That's what I want to say, answering your question. I hope I did answer yeah, your question. Thank you very thank much. You.
very well explained thank you thanks uh we would have loved to have more interactions but by seeing the time because yeah I, <laughs> yes sir i'm afraid i'm talking too much yep yeah, no 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 <laughs> it's a pleasure to listen to you and experts like you and you know uh, the stalwarts and you had been working with our uh, chief coach of sai so we are there are lots to learn and listen uh, only the constraint is the time but definitely once this lockdown gets over we would love to call you back Uh, to india to listen anyway you are when you come to gujarat do visit bangalore we'll have lots of interactions so I'd on the have- bangalore is one of my if not my favorite i think it's my favorite place in india bangalore yeah. we are pr- privileged and play- <laughs> pleasure to host you once you come to bangalore thank you uh, i will try my level best thank you i request our uh, lakshmi sir to uh, give the word uh, thanks to because as you had been working so it my privilege to request you yeah my heart is with him we always uh, we have same wavelength and his uh, early days initiatives were excellent uh, we really you know reap the fruit of his uh, uh, expertise and uh, we need more and more such expert and uh, uh, making sport performance perfect they are the base the foundation for better sports performance is better training methodology without blueprint without methods we cannot reach anywhere so we are lucky to have professor alexander today here and everyone in this community those who are uh, viewing this program are highly uh, motivated and he made their responsibility very clear short and uh, also he has shared you no know, micro information about multidisciplinary engagement in injury management wonderful presentation new dimension it is a new trend you have brought it into this uh, conference thank you very much uh, professor alexander thank you thank you lakshmi ji please don't professor me come on we, we are i mean you you are kind of not less a professor than i am thank you so much and really happy to contribute thank you thank you so we'll be in touch with you so please yes sir thank you right. accept our token of respect and regards thank, thank you, you so much, much. <laughs> thank you sir pleasure is mine and honor thank you thank you now i request our next eminent speaker khyati madam Khyati Wakaria, madam. Yes. 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 I have a check with the audio and video. It's working, ma'am.
Madam, can you hear us? There is some sound. Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely fine. Okay, perfect. It's the other way around for Lakshmi sir with headphone for you without headphone. Wonderful. <laughs> the technology is doing great. Some okay, okay. ma'am, if you can stop sharing screen so that I can introduce, then you can go ahead with us sharing the screen now. All right. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, wonderful. So we are here with our, the final speaker of the day. And it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Khyati Wakaria Madden, who has done her MD sports medicine PG resident, resident from New Delhi. Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery from Bangalore Medical College and Research Institute, Bangalore, and PUC from Christ Jinni College, and she is an IAF certified youth athletic coach. So to know that she is an athlete and she is a doctor, and this is a rare blend like how we have seen in Kulkarniji. So as I had been telling, like you no know, uh, second speaker who has accepted our invitation is Khyati Wakaria Madden after Kiran Kulkarniji. And we, as again, I am repeating the same. We started with just our college awareness in the sports arena. And then from there, both of them, the moment they set feet to the program and then Alexander Sir came in, then it became international program. So we bow to you and with great respect and humbleness, we invite you and it's our pleasure to introduce as you are an international pole vaulter, participated in Asian Championship and Asian Indoor Championship, finishing in fifth place. Seven time national champion, senior interstate meet record holder, two time All India Inter University champion and record holder, state record holder, and four time RGUHS champion in university athletics. And in gymnastics, trained in gymnastics from age five to 18 years. National medalist and state champion in artistic gymnastics, represented India at the FitKit World Championship held in Malaysia in 2007 and finished 12th. Awards, Ekalavi Award by State Government of Karnataka for achievements in the field of athletics in 2016. Outstanding student award of the batch at Bangalore Medical College and Research Institute from our beloved president, ex-president, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam in 2013. Idea Student Award for Excellence in Sports in 2012 and Indian Young Jnana Award for Excellence in Academics in 2007. On the panel of speakers at the press conference of orthopedics and sports medicine department of Fortis Hospital, Benargata on November 19, 2015, and lead speaker at National Conference on Issues and Trends in Modern System of Physical Education and Sports Science on the topic Women and Sports held at Karnataka State Women's University, Bijapur in 2013. We are so humbled and privileged and we'll be listening to you, the overtraining issues in the kids and your expertise. Over to you, man. Thank you so much for introducing me. Uh, I think I'm uh, deeply humbled. Uh, and I thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here and uh, speak on overtraining. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, it's the need of the hour where, you know, parents are pushing kids that, you know, they want to become, they want to have kids who are like, you know, elite athletes and there's so much pressure. And I think this is an issue that, you know, uh, we should talk about. So I'm going to try to share my screen now. OK, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. OK, so overtraining in young athletes. So how common is overtraining? So in the London 2012 Olympics, almost half the athletes who sought physio treatment there suffered from uh, overtraining. 
and almost half of the athletes who were treated that say, said that they had pre-existing injuries so the incidence of overtraining in sport is about 20 to 30 percent and it is seen more in individual sports uh female athletes and those representing at the highest level but then this does not start when the athlete reaches the highest level it starts way you know way before in the years that they are training to reach that level so uh, david neiman the former vice president of the american college of sports medicine said that overtraining syndrome is one of the scariest things that he has seen in his 30 years of working with athletes so one of the book describes it as a slow poisoning of the nervous system which could last for weeks or months and it is in essence it seems like the body's slowly dying from within so this is a big issue and uh, as uh, you know uh, the uh, part of you know getting children to into sport and i think we should be more responsible about how uh, children take up sport and you know the level they reach without being burnt out so here is a case study uh, a 22 year old uh, male triathlete so he went through uh, a 45 weeks of training that is from his pre season into his competition season so he was asked to maintain a training log which included the you know the kind of training that he had the intensity the volume whether he did certain uh, training uh, in groups or did he do it alone the number of hours that he trained and he also filled out the uh, acute burnout questionnaire throughout his training and the mtds uh, scale that is the multi component training distress scale and uh, this uh, athlete and his coach were uh, you know structurally questioned post the entire season and all the results were uh, analyzed retrospectively so what what happened through the entire season so his so uh, this is his plan like it goes through various phases of general preparation uh, specific preparation pre competition mid competition and end of competition so this is what happened with him so in phase 1 where he when when he underwent general preparation he felt on track with training he just had minor aches and pains was but his motivation was good and he was able to train going into phase 2 of uh, specific preparation he developed certain injuries and illnesses going into phase 3 the pre competition phase he felt back on track because there was reduction in the load when you're preparing for competition so he felt like his body was okay and he, things were you know moving good going into phase 4 the mid competition and that being the most important part where you know everything that he was training for was this at this point he developed iron deficiency anemia felt flat um you know could not train for a week so he took rest came back after a week and then trained at 150% and uh, what follows is he had uh, an elevated heart rate uh, you know had submaximal uh, heart rate is suppressed uh, and one of his uh, during one of his swims he has he had spatial disorientation in water and uh, he just felt like he could not continue anymore and ended his competitive season prematurely on retrospectively looking back at the training log and the data that he had entered uh, looking at the acute burnout questionnaire there were three things in the burnout questionnaire the first thing was uh, let me okay so the first thing was uh, a reduced sense of accomplishment so here we see in the phase 4 which was his main competition uh, you know uh, part of his training this area showed reduce he had reduced sense of accomplishment in the most important part of his season coming down here again you see the sport devaluation was highest in phase 4 his his emotional and physical exhaustion peaked at the competition level looking back at the mtds score uh, the first thing is uh, they looked at depression so you know just because he wasn't competing well and you know there, there was so much competition comparing himself with his peers there was you know depression he de he developed depression in uh, phase 4 then uh, there was less vigor 
he did not feel energetic he wasn't able to you know uh, you know do what his mind actually wanted him to do then there were physical uh, signs and symptoms of ex exhaustion in phase 4 and uh, coming to sleep disturbances so at the point where he moved into his specific preparation here there was there was a lot of sleep disturbances then he had more perceived stress at in the mid competition season and he was fatigued by the time he reached uh, you know uh, his uh, peak so this was an overview of you know what happened so now we so this uh, was an example of an athlete being overtrained and you know not being able to accomplish what he worked so hard and built throughout the season and this was in an athlete who was uh, probably you know was undergoing a very structured program like you know he had this periodization he had 9 weeks of uh, training in each of the phases just like slowly to build up to the competition uh, season to peak there and turned out that you know even with such train uh, such you know planning and everything he was still burnt out so what is overtraining now overtraining is a complex clinical disorder that is identified in athletic population that represents a mal adaptive response to training so training uh, overtraining is when there is an imbalance between the training and the recovery so the athlete or the child is training more but not giving enough time to recover from that so what is the difference between an overtraining and burnout so burnout is because of overtraining there is mental overload and mental exhaustion so that is what we call burnout and this overtraining comes in various uh, shapes and forms it could be increased volume of training increased intensity of training or frequency of training so a young athlete now who is a young athlete that we are talking about here so a child or an adolescent aged 8 to 18 years participating in any kind of organized training in order to acquire skills and fitness for current and future sports participation so this is the population that we are going to address today so what are the terminology so overtraining uh, is not just a single uh, entity by itself it represents a continuum and this continuum uh, starts from acute fatigue functional overreaching non functional overreaching and then going into overtraining syndrome so overtraining syndrome as such is you know towards the other end of the spectrum but there are a lot of things that build into getting a child to that over overtraining syndrome phase so now uh, so i said uh, that you know all this was there has to be a balance between how much you train and how you recover and uh, recover is uh, you know it's just uh, seen as such a bad thing that you know it gives you a sense that uh, like the athletes feel like they're not doing enough you know so but you know there has to be a balance that you know you're training so much for it to you know adapt into your body you have to give it that much time to recover so when training and recovery uh when the training is just a little you know pushing the limit a little just a little bit but you're giving enough time to recover it can lead to acute fatigue but this acute fatigue it need not be a bad thing it is how athletes uh, improve their performance now when we go to functional overreaching that is when the training is slightly more higher than the recovery and when we go to non functional overreaching and overtraining uh this is not a physiological response this is more of like you know you're doing more harm than good it's pathological and here the training is way more than the recovery so over a period of time the athlete is going to be so fatigued and burnt out so we want to do everything to prevent the child from going into this non functional overreaching and overtraining syndrome so here is a graph uh, which shows at this end is acute fatigue so you know you're training this uh, kid and you're giving this exercise stimulus right here and uh, then you're giving the kid enough time to recover so you give them two or three days and you know they're back to baseline again then again you give a stimulus they probably improve over time like if you're giving too much training 
and less recovery it can lead to accumulated fatigue or chronic fatigue that would take about like you know 5 between 5 to 10 days of complete recovery and the child is able to get back coming to overreaching now overreaching you are at the border line where you know a little more you could tip on to the other side but overreaching um, when uh, you know there's so much training stimulus without adequate recovery it could take about one or two weeks to completely uh, like with complete rest and he can return to baseline but when he tips over to overtraining when you're training so much and giving so little recovery he you know after even after several months he may or may not be able to come back to baseline again so this leads to you know like younger athletes quitting sport and not being motivated and you know feeling like you know for them like training would be like a very dreaded ex- experience so what is the difference see so here we are giving a training stimulus we are giving enough time to recover and then we are recovering recovering he reaches here you give another training stimulus and this raises his level to here then again you give him enough time to recover then give a give a training stimulus and this leads to a positive training adaptation so this is what we want to see in an athlete while if you are giving a training stimulus not giving enough recovery and uh, then again a training stimulus then it's just going downhill then this is a negative training adaptation and this is what we don't want so what do we want so you know we want to give we want to give an exercise stimulus and this is the training and uh, because of training there's a you know there's little muscle breakdown and you know but you give them enough time to recover and then you give a training stimulus again and then there is this is called the super compensation so there is no exact timeline and you know one size fits all um, phenomenon but you're giving training giving adequate recovery seeing how you know how the athlete is doing and then giving a stimulus again that will lead to super compensation and super compensation is what you know everyone is looking for like you know for a child to improve in his game uh, improve in performance it comes here in the super compensation now what does overtraining do right quite the opposite so you give a training stimulus not enough recovery he comes back here again you're not you're, you're giving a training stimulus not enough recovery comes here again the same thing and it's just downhill so this is what we don't want and this is what overtraining looks like so when you ramp the progression you want it to go to a, the training threshold to go to just that enough like the overreaching where you've just pushed the limit not so much that you know it's going downhill but you know there is a positive adaptation there is super compensation and there is improvement what we do want is you know we are for the child is overreaching and then you're still going on training not giving enough recovery and then there is failure to adapt he goes into you know fatigue and performance decline that is overtraining and then after that there is failure to adapt and then it leads to overuse injuries like stress fractures heat injuries muscle breakdown and you know this leads to a lot of kids um, you know opting out of sport at a very young age so what are the signs of overtraining so performance related there is unexplained underperformance there is increased sense of effort in training and competition mood related there is lack of motivation depressed mood difficulty concentrating irritability and the child is uh, probably uncooperative to the teammates and coaching staff uh fatigue and sleep related there is persistent fatigue disturbed sleep and uh, coming to the somatic side there is persistent muscle stiffness soreness uh, frequent you know upper respiratory illnesses especially chronic and recurrent overuse injuries and weight loss so if there is a coach out there who's training an athlete and sees any of this uh, i think that should raise a red flag and you know he should uh, reconsider what he is doing with the child diagnosis of overreaching so uh, overreaching the diagnosis made uh, more after ruling out you know the other diseases so what the other diseases could be is like you know a child could be having sleep disorders or you know anemia like you know does not have enough hemoglobin 
uh, has nutritional disorders, thyroid issues, heart issues, or any post-viral uh, syndrome. So once we uh, examine and rule out all this, and with this, if there is a history of you know recent uh, increase in the frequency, duration, or intensity of exercise, then we think that you know maybe this could be an overtraining. So you know then uh, you have to start asking the appropriate questions, you know, and looking into the training side of the uh, kid. Uh, coming to examination, the heart rate, you know, both the uh, resting and post exercise, um, maybe like uh, higher. Then the heart rate var variability is more. The maximum heart rate achieved during exercise could be less or more, depending on whether you know his uh, sympathetic system uh, is just like he's in hyper arousal state, and his parasympathetic system is not working, not able to get back the body to you know the baseline again. So the body is just going to go like crazy. So you know there are uh, different things that uh, one can pick up, uh, which would not be a normal. Uh, you know, scenario in a young kid. Uh, looking at the diagnosis, what all do we do? First, as I said, you know, we have to rule out all the other diseases before we could even diagnose overtraining. So, you know, basic uh, blood panel with a complete uh, blood count, iron levels, a basic metabolic panel, kidney function test, uh, thyroid profile, uh, creatine kinase, basic hormonal uh, profile, uh, serum lactate, glutamine, and if there is an athlete who is an endurance athlete and who normally have a lower resting heart rate, if they have an elevated resting heart rate, we look at the ECG. We do sleep monitoring. And another uh, good thing is there is a rest question, rest cue questionnaire that could be filled. And, you know, based on the scoring, we could get to know if, you know, the child is not recovering or is going into over overtraining. So what are the recent trends? The evolution of you know sports participation, where it from a child-driven recreational play to an adult-driven, highly structured, deliberate practice, pressure from the parents and coaches to outdo uh, you know their uh, competitors, and it's more of you know the parents forcing the kid to get into a certain kind of training, uh, you know, just to become that elite athlete that they want to see him or her. Uh, early specialization the mindset that more is better and then you know downsizing adult training programs to fit younger athletes and we always have to remember that young athletes are not miniature adults we uh, they are at a very different uh, you know spectrum altogether they are you know at a growing phase uh, not having enough developed you know organs and everything as adults so we cannot just downsize the adult training programs and try to fit it to young athletes now, uniqueness of a child athlete. So looking at, you know, six to 11 years where they are yet to complete their growth process and attain full maturation. So there are a few things that we look at is motor skills. So what happens at this age is like, you know, the big muscles are developing initially and uh, like towards like six to eight years. And this is a chance to uh, build motor skills, which is a normal stage in the development of a child. Uh, the child begins to run, jump, swim, climb, uh, then skill and coordination. So the smaller muscles develop a little later, like towards the age of 10, 11. So at that point, you uh, like it is uh, they, they're able to pick up finer skills. Then endurance capacity. So a child's heart is bigger than as compared to the rest of the body. So their endurance capacity is increased. Now, uh, there is uh, a, the speed window, which is about uh, between the ages of six to nine. And this first speed window is when the brain is developing and, uh, you know, uh, it's forming new neural connections. So this is the time you can uh, work on uh, training reflexes, uh, change of direction speed, and uh, not necessarily like, you know, uh, trying to make the child run like a fast 30 meters or a 60 meters because they're anaerobic system which is mainly required when they run the first six to 10 seconds is not developed. So that's not this speed is. This speed is more of, you know, the reflexes. Then the flexibility. This is uh, the time to develop flexibility is six to 10 years. That this window, uh, you know, goes a long way. Uh, if you are going to train the flexibility, it's going to go a very long way. 
then metabolism uh, they ha they have a normally they have a higher resting heart rate and they have a less efficient metabolism so you know you don't want to make the child do a lot of you know lactate kind of workout you know long uh, hard workouts because you know they are not they are not that mature to metabolize the lactate and all that coming to the central nervous system they have a short attention span and they have limited memory so everything that a child sees is they are going to mimic that so if you're going to show the child how to long jump he's going to he or she is going to look at you and you know try to mimic that so this these are the unique features of a child athlete uh, between 6 to 11 years coming to the stages of athlete development so uh, there is one part which is the physical literacy so you know training a athlete young in developing his motor and you know uh, coordination skills goes a long way and this physical literacy uh, is good it's good to start young you know have an active start learn the fundamentals then at the age of you know closer to like 9 to 11 you want the at the you want the kid to learn how to train you know have a little bit of structure in the training program not too much you know still having fun but you know still trying to learn what it means to train uh, then coming to training to train so now like you know they are a little more like they are just like you know at the like the adolescent age they understand a little more so then they understand what it means to train then come learning how to compete comes way after they learn out after uh, how to train and then training to compete and then training to win this is the most elite level and you know the child has to go through all these progressions to actually reach that level readiness now the child's level of growth maturity and development that enables him or her to perform the tasks and meet the uh, demands of training and competition so there is a physical readiness and there is a psychological readiness so you know physical readiness you look at the developmental age more than the chronological age you see like you know there may be a child who is probably you know uh, like chronologically like 6 years old but uh, developmentally he could either be 4 or 8 so you know you know being aware of the these kind of discrepancies is important and that de determines the physical readiness not his precise age coming to uh, psychological readiness you know at different uh, ages the child is uh, the awareness and attention span is different so when you're looking at a 6 year old child his awareness and attention span is way lesser than you know you're looking at a 12 or 14 year old so you know being aware of the uh, attention span the memory and you know how much can they take you know uh, you don't want to you know bombard the athlete with so much information that they don't even understand so you know consistent coaching techniques positive feedback but this is the time to you know uh, uh, kind of put across the codes of behavior uh, you know make them understand what teamwork is what cooperation fair play and uh, you know sport should always foster a positive self concept and it should be a healthy motivational environment uh, one big thing that i have seen a lot is you know a lot of coaches Uh, not trying to blame anybody here but you know they have a very uh, negative way of trying to motivate kids and that just does not work you don't want to say tell a kid like you know you're just you're just useless you you don't know how to do this or you know it should be more of a positive thing even though he's doing 10 things wrong he's probably doing one thing right and uh, you know uh, telling him that would probably motivate him to do even better now coming to critical periods of trainability so there are certain uh, training windows uh, you know when certain skills or uh, certain uh, uh, you know things are trained at that uh, window then there is uh, a optimum adaptation and it does not mean that these are the only windows where you know if you it's like you you catch the bus or you miss the bus it's like you these are if you are going to train it in this window then it's going to go a long way but it does not mean that only this certain thing is trained at this certain time all systems are always trainable at all ages so it, this this is just more of you know giving an idea as to okay this should be done right now you know the kid must be like they will adapt to this at this point but it's not like a rigid thing and uh, even though like um, 
here like from say, from about 7 to 13 years this is the skill window so here the brain is brain of the kid is developing this is forming new neural connections and uh, you know he's uh, able to uh, you know this is more of like mim 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 mimicking so you know he's going to mimic every move that you make so you know this is a good window to develop skill but that doesn't mean you'll develop only skill you're going to work through all the different parameters but yes he will be more receptive to skill coming to you know there are speed windows so and that might be a little different uh, between uh, boys and girls so the first speed window as i said so the first speed window the child is like about 7 to 9 years and you are trying to mostly train reflexes you know like you know just uh, you clap and you know you want the kid to run so you know just those reflexes or change directions so that kind of training and the speed window too is when the uh, anaerobic system actually develops so this speed window too is when you can train an athlete to you know um, probably run a 6 second sprint uh, you know that kind of speed training coming to the strength now uh, i think even in the previous uh, uh, talk we were uh, talking a lot about the strength window and uh, so now uh, there is something called as the peak height velocity which i will say so, uh, like i will show you subsequently and uh, this strength window is very important and uh, like and it differs a little bit between the boys and the girls so for the girls uh, the as soon as she attains menarche you can start strength training like you will see you know very good gains at that point but for a boy uh, it's going to be you know he attains his peak height velocity and uh, it should be at least delayed for 12 to 18 months before you start you know a very structured strength training program and coming to the aerobic window you know when this is when like the body the metabolism is uh, matured and you know they are able to uh, you know process the lactate and everything so that is the aerobic window now coming to an adolescent athlete an athlete aged about 12 to 16 years so peak height velocity is one of the most important changes that is taking place in an adolescent athlete so this peak height velocity is a little different girls attain it about 2 years earlier than boys so what happens at this point is you know there's a lot of growth that is taking place uh, there is both growth in the bone and the muscle uh, like the limbs are getting uh, longer and you know the athlete suddenly feels like you know just because the limbs are getting longer trunk is not you know increasing so much uh, there is a temporary loss of coordination so it appears that you know the uh, athlete is a little clumsy but uh, you know and this is like a very you know different phase where the entire body seems to be changing and you know there's a lot to cope with for an adolescent athlete now coming to flexibility so what happens is uh, the bone and the muscle both are growing but the bone is growing faster than the muscle so what happens is as the muscle growth is lagging behind the bone that that you know uh, decreases the flexibility because you know the muscle is going to become tight and there will be like a temporary you know uh, decreased flexibility at this point moving to like anaerobic system as i said you know the anaerobic system starts developing so then you can start training uh, you know at a like a higher intensity like you want to give them like 6 to 10 second sprints this is when they their body is ready to you know go through that kind of training so this is the this i was talking is the speed window the second speed window where you can uh, train the athlete for speed and this is more of like the linear speed coming to the endurance uh, window you know prior to the peak height velocity there is an there is a you know uh, an endurance window as like you know the lungs are getting bigger the metabolism is you know maturing coming to the strength now uh, the, there has been a lot of debate on this and uh, you can start a strength training for girls like at the onset of menarche and boys about 6 to i mean 12 to 18 months after the peak height velocity but again it's not like a one size fits all like you have to see like how much of you know physical literacy they have how much of you know training years they've had behind them do they know how to do like simple body weight exercises um, you know then you can progress from simple body weight to a little bit of resistance to like machines and then you know uh, free weights but during adolescence a big no 
is you know getting the athletes to do olympic lifts so this is going to you know uh, there at this time the adolescent athletes they have like um, they yet to achieve their maximum growth so there is a, a, a like a lot of uh, the physis what we call you know where the bone growth actually takes place that could be injured by you know doing like such uh, like um, like olympic lifts you know which need a lot of coordination their heavier weight and anything could go wrong so their epiphysis is very weak at this point during adolescence so you don't want to harm that and that is why olympic lifts for an adolescent athlete is a big no coming to uh, you know the central nervous system the attention span increases the memory skills increase so here they understand a little more you know their psychological training also can begin so and in an adolescent athlete there are a lot of changes that are happening in his body and you definitely want to reduce training load at this point to prevent any injuries which could have you know long lasting you know lifelong uh, effects so this was what i was talking about is the peak height velocity now here we see that in the in the females the peak height velocity is about 2 years before you know uh, boys reach their peak height velocity and uh, peak, and if you see the strength now you can start training for strength like this is the peak height velocity and this is probably somewhere close to where the girl is, uh, attains menarche and this is where you can start uh, strength training but for a guy uh, it would be like the strength training would be like you know see 6 to about 12 to 18 months after he achieves his peak height velocity now what are the misconceptions that children need androgens for strength gain so the first question is what kind of strength gain are you talking about so if you're talking about strength gain which is more of like you know having big muscles and all that yes that's not going to happen that needs androgen but uh, there is also a neural component like uh, you know like you know having motor units fire together and you know that kind of strength the neuromuscular strength that strength does not need androgens and you know just the fact that children need androgens for strength gain is a big misconception and another big misconception is you lose flexibility with strength training which is not true you know as i said like a comprehensive training program includes everything like right from speed to strength to flexibility to agility and just because you know you're training for strength does not mean you will lose flexibility so a well designed program uh you know that incorporates components of flexibility should result in no loss of flexibility in conjunction to gains in strength training so this is the emphasis of this again that young athletes are not miniature adults and we should never never downsize uh, you know adult programs to fit kids and you know think that you know they are just like a smaller version of the bigger thing and it's going to work no it's not going to work now growth and injury in young adults uh, young athletes sorry so there are different mechanisms through which uh, injuries happen it could be acute trauma it could be repetitive micro trauma or a combination of both now coming to physical injuries that i was talking about so physis uh, you know it, this is the growth plate and uh, you know if there is an injury at this uh, you know juncture it is taken very very seriously because uh, you know it can affect uh, the growth it could lead to permanent loss of growth or disruption to linear growth or it could lead to some deformities you know and this happens in the adolescent growth spurt most commonly so you know this is something that uh, we as clinicians never ever want to see is physical injuries now this could be like you know if a adolescent kid is you know running a lot of marathons you know that could lead to repetitive micro trauma and that could lead to these kind of uh, epiphysical injuries then uh, subsequently there could be a delay in growth or growth could all together be you know shut down a lot of gymnasts go through physical injuries so you know gymnastics is a sport that uh, you know um, probably their peak age is about 14 16 so you know they at even at the age of 10 or 11 years they are overtraining and uh, if you see like you know they say like 
um, gymnasts are always always short but you know is it their training that makes them short or is it the other way around is is a question yet to be answered uh, but uh, you know a gymnast like supposing a gymnast undergoes like some kind of injury and is given some amount of rest you you see that suddenly that gymnast you know begins to gain height again like you know so this overtraining that gymnasts go through at such a young age could you know possibly uh, you know stop be stopping the growth like you know increase in height or you know like body so it's seen that you know many gymnasts who were injured took about rest of like which they needed rest about 6 3 to 6 uh, you know months and you know then again they are like you know suddenly they become tall and then they say like you know like you know you not you cannot do gymnastics again so you know these are things that you know whether the training is causing gymnasts to be short or the other way around is very interesting so now uh, these physical injuries are a marker of overtraining and if any child athlete is seen with such an injury uh one has to look into the kind of training that the child is undergoing now apophysitis or growing pains so uh, in adolescent growth spurts as i said that bones are growing at a much faster rate than the muscle is growing so the muscle becomes tighter and where it attaches to the bone the, the that is what we call the apophysis that is there there is a lot of strain at that point so that could lead to apophysal avulsions where the whole thing could be like ripped off or they could be uh, you know repetitive injury which causes inflammation at the apophysis so that is what we call apophysitis now here there is relatively increased tension in the muscle decreased flexibility during this phase and uh, so when any adolescent is undergoing growing uh, growing pains what we call apophysitis training intensity should be reduced and there should be like slow stretching uh, exercise program that should be initiated now coming to patello femoral pain uh, one of the most uh, uh, important and painful conditions so in kids um, so just to give like uh, you know somebody who's not having a medical background so a lot of um, you know older people develop what we call arthritis you know a lot of older people develop knee pains and uh you know are unable to walk so, you know because and so painful so there the articular cartilage is damaged so giving just just giving you a perspective so if there is a kid and the kid is having that kind of articular damage you can imagine how painful it is for the kid so you know uh, this could lead to like you know as you can see here that could lead to permanent damage to the articular cartilage and that could be so painful and that part of the uh, cartilage may just like you know die away so um, this this is also a very important uh, uh i request the delegates to just wait for a minute a ma'am has lost the connectivity she will be back
Yes, ma'am is back. One second, ma'am. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is this where you lost me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so coming to the other overuse injuries, such as uh, tendonitis, uh, we uh, see a lot of uh, Achilles tendonitis, patella tendonitis, which does not develop, you know, uh, in an acute setting. It is uh, a long over the years uh, training kind of injuries. And uh, flat foot, uh, flat foot, I think, is uh, such a big issue, uh, which causes a bunch of different, uh, you know, problems in an athlete, which, you know, one may not even realize arises from flat foot. So, you know, there are a lot of athletes who come in who have like ACL tears and then you see their feet and, you know, like they just have flat foot in that leg. Like supposing they have a ACL tear in the right knee, they have a flat foot in the, they just have right sided flat foot. So I think picking up flat foot, um, you know, can, can go a long way in preventing injuries. And this is something that, you know, even like um, a coach who's training an athlete could, you know, probably... Um, you know, catch right away. And if you do, and you know, it is something that, you know, if, if, if it is, um, you know, it could be something that, uh, you know, you put a, like an art support or something, and that could prevent uh, other injuries. So flat foot, uh, always, always Um, coaches big can you hear me yes ma'am we can hear you oh. yeah then another overuse injury is uh, low back pain so you know um, it could be like you know um, spine fractures that could you know cause pain coming to heat injuries now children are uh, more vulnerable to heat related injuries uh, or hyperthermia as we call it because they have very immature thermal regulation so you know they are unable to effectively regulate their temperature they have immature sweat glands don't produce enough sweat so sweat helps in cooling our body they you know they're not able to pro produce that amount of sweat they have larger skin surface area and then they are more sensitive they do not they are unable to acclimatize and they produce more metabolic heat uh, you know per unit body mass and uh, this causes rapid increase in body temperature and also children uh, when they are into physical activity instinctively drink less water during exercise so you know one uh, anyone coaching children should be very aware that you know you're you know you're not coaching in high heats and uh, you know high heat heat conditions like more than 20 uh, degrees celsius with like more like 70 percent humidity and if so then you have to reduce the time of training now the female athlete tried so uh, may like seen in a lot of sports uh, where uh, the female wants to look a particular way wants to be thin or uh, and then she's just like you know taking low energy intake um, you know, irregular eating, having eating disorders, having eating disorders where uh, she is unable to like, uh, if, even if she's binge, she's binge eating and then, you know, throwing up uh, just to make sure that, you know, there is not enough going into her body and making her fat. So this leads to like menstrual dysfunction, uh, reduced bone mineral density. And you know, lead to osteoporosis, weak bones, and you know, menstrual disturbances. Now, rehabilitation of a young athlete. So, just uh, I think uh, you know, this is an important message here that uh, we feel like children heal very rapidly, 
and uh, you know enough credit should be given to their you know growing age and uh, immature uh, you know organs and all of that that you know we should not assume that children heal rapidly so what happens is just just because of that assumption there is you know faster recover uh, return to sport and then the child is then again re injured and re injured so uh, you know rehabilitation of young athletes should be taken a little more slowly so they this should include education on uh, inflammation and pain promote healing restore the function of the part that was injured and then make sure that it is safe enough for the athlete to go back to sport and competition and uh, you know most important thing is the, if the athlete is injured today you should do everything in your hand to prevent any future injury now prevention of overtraining so an important concept that the who had put out was along back was you know establishment of sports injury surveillance system where you know uh, children who are into sport are uh, you know there is a surveillance that uh, should take place to make sure that you know are not like a lot of uh, child athletes or young athletes are injured and uh, i think this uh, should be implemented in some form and there are a very there are very few countries who are implementing such programs or such systems and i think this goes a long way in preventing uh, you know overtraining when there is some kind of monitoring that is that will be there so what do you do now as a clinician uh, every chance every time a young athlete comes it is a chance like every interaction with them is a chance to know more and every interaction with, with them you know you 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 can see more things you can pick up more things so just uh, that could you know keep the health athlete uh, healthy for a longer period so longevity uh, should be the mantra and coming to the intrinsic factors like uh, like you know every time like um, a child athlete is coming to a doctor uh, you know you have to see there is is there any anatomical malalignments is there any muscle tendon imbalances what stage of growth process is the child uh, in is the chronological and the developmental age you know in sync is there any associated disease states that may be present at the time of injury coming to the extrinsic uh, factors are there uh, any errors of training or technique which is causing the injury is there some improper coaching is there overtraining uh, is there improper footwear or protective equipment uh, is there any excessive irregularities or hard surface of playing uh is there any what is the nutritional status what is the uh, you know cultural uh, background what is the psychological and sociological factors so every interaction with a child or an adolescent athlete is a chance to know more prevention of overtraining uh so another thing could be you know like you know being very creative when it comes to training kids uh you know never kill the fun out of the game so you know keeping the fun factor alive should be the topmost priority having multi sport activities you know preventing early specialization uh, making the exposing the kid to you know various different sports or various different events in the same sport uh, could help in like an overall holistic development of the athlete uh, making sure that the child has age appropriate sporting equipment and uh, you know you know a lot of like backyard play like just for fun like no rules um, you know just for fun uh, and periodization 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 is one of the factors that could prevent overtraining so that could keep a check on overtraining not that it like you know as we saw in the case study it's not like a 100% thing but at least i think a large number of uh, uh, you know overtrained athletes would the number would just come down so attention to playing conditions volume intensity and the credentials of a youth sports coach is of paramount importance so this is just like a brief uh, i'm not going to go into the details of periodization but you know periodization periodization is just a coaching uh, coaching tool so where you know the the athlete's program is planned on scientific basis so there are the components are a macro cycle which is about 6 to 18 weeks and then meso cycle which like a bunch of mes meso cycles make up a micro cycle uh, macro cycle and a bunch of micro cycles make up a meso cycle so it's just breaking down of the overall training program based on the goals of the season 
so as we saw in the case study as well uh, there is a general preparation specific preparation pre competition competition and post competition so a lot of things vary the volume intensity and the you know technical uh, training would all differ like uh, based on what uh, phase of the training program you are in okay so that's achieving young uh, risk burnout so here is mondo de plantes he is the so does achieving young risk burnout so here is mondo duplantis he is the pole vault world record holder very recently and uh, he is just 19 years of age and you know having a world record to his name is a big big accomplishment and to to perform at such an elite level so does this put him at a risk of overtraining yes but you know like knowing his background would be more important here so mondo duplantis is trained by his uh, dad who is his coach and his dad uh, greg duplantis make sure that he uh, even though mondo is competing at such elite levels he still make sure that you know he's playing golf he's playing baseball he's playing you know yet even at this point when he has the world record to his name he is still playing a number of sports and uh, you know uh, so greg definitely knows uh, you know that he does not want to burn out his kid and so achieving young does not mean burnout but at the same time uh, you should know what all should be done with the athlete in order to prevent or you know uh, prevent the athlete from going to that state same event different story this is uh, elisa mccartney she is an olympic bronze medalist in pole vault in uh, the rio olympics so she was just a 19 year old when she won the bronze and uh, it was much to her surprise that uh, you know uh, she performed brilliantly and you know everything was going well but after the rio olympics she developed achilles tendonitis and her entire team has been working so hard to you know uh, you know rehab her and get her back but she has never she has not been able to come back to that uh, level that you know she performed at the rio olympics and recently in the olympic trials of new zealand she did not make the olympic team so such is the nature of the sport but you know there could be something else in the background like you know she is having such uh, it could just be an overuse injury and it's just uh, proving much more difficult for her to come back from it so this is just two sides of the same coin uh, the take home points uh, sport should be fun uh, focus on establishing an interdisciplinary approach more is not always better make sure that the kids enjoy the sport and grow in a positive way to achieve their full potential prevention of injury is much much better than treating a holistic approach so that the kids uh, go on this don't just become good in sport but become good responsible human beings and uh, sport definitely has a lot to teach uh, you know if you're willing to learn and uh, giving back uh, i think you know as coaches and uh, you know um, Uh, coaches of young athletes uh, you know there is always a chance to change their mindset from you know like what am i going to get versus okay this has given me so much what am i going to give back you know so i think this kind of approach and uh, top priority child is much more important than the sport so prioritizing the child and the child's health is very important thank you so much for listening to me and uh, i hope uh, uh you know you can get out some important message from this yes ma'am so if you can you know uh, stop sharing the screen and come so that we'll be posing question to you on behalf of thank you ma'am so the first question is from dr jade what is the correct age for children to start weight training yeah as i said again so um yeah by like you know weight training 
what is it you know like if you're doing free body weights yes you can start very early but if you are thinking like free weights and those kind of things uh, definitely definitely wait till the child has achieved his peak height velocity uh you know don't do it before that because you know the 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 physis is not fused and uh, you know you could cause more harm than good and even when you progress you you want to progress from you want to progress from uh you know just body weight uh training to resistance training to machine and then free weights so you know it has to be a process you cannot just jump one um and you know reach there but definitely wait until the child you know reaches a peak their peak height velocity uh for boys especially wait for uh, 12 to 18 months after reaching the peak velo- peak height velocity to begin any kind of like intense uh you know weight training okay ma'am the next uh is from lakshmi sir uh what is the effect of ot on immunity level of children particularly amidst the pandemic of covid-19 okay so uh, definitely uh, you know the covid pandemic has uh, taken such a toll on us and uh, even uh, as kids uh, or even any athlete who would want to get back to training and uh, you know perform performance uh, one thing is it has to be a slow, pro- slow process and the other thing is uh, the most important illness that you know even through overtraining is respiratory tract infections and uh, as we know that covid-19 has you know has been a big uh, infection that has you know uh, affected the respiratory system so you know being very aware of um, uh, you know preventing these kind of respiratory infections in children it could be the due to overtraining or like you know due to covid-19 or even like in the uh, post viral stage they could still develop respiratory infections so uh, making sure that uh, the respiratory system is healthy and uh, taking all precautions especially with child and young athletes because you don't want to damage their lungs lungs when they are so young so definitely a word of precaution there thank you thank you ma'am the next question from babu prasad ji how can we treat the patellar tendons okay so patella tendonitis first is to establish the diagnosis of patella tendonitis so you know a child would come like you know uh, with a history of you know a lot of uh, you know jumps in training um, or you know like jumping on very hard surfaces and they would come mostly with like you know i'm unable to climb stairs or i'm having too much pain in the front of the front of my knee so first thing that we do is give time for it to heal and then slowly we you know put them through a rehab program which begins with an with uh, isometric strengthening and then slowly uh, you know once it is uh, healed you move towards more of eccentric strengthening so that is the way to go for patellar tendonitis and also more of uh, you know uh, making sure that you know the whole kinetic chain is addressed are there any issues in the hip are there any issues in the ankle is the ankle not moving okay is the hip abductor is weak so i think like an overall um, examination of the child because any injury that any person comes with is not just lay. so if somebody comes with a knee injury it we need not be just uh, the knee so now like a child could come with flat foot but uh, not complain of flat foot as such but would devel- would come with knee pain so you know looking at everything and uh, mostly finding out that you know what is causing this is uh, goes a long way and uh, i think this should be the approach Uh, of looking at the overall picture than just looking at what is causing the problem i mean what is the problem okay uh, what is the oxygen level must be for a children in super com- compensation condition so as a child um, you know their uh, uh, respiratory systems are not developed as much their uh, anaerobic systems are not developed as much so even as such uh, for a normal activity the child needs more oxygen to do a certain activity 
like it needs more like it uses more of body metabolism more of oxygen to do a certain activity which an adult would probably do it much easier so definitely a child would uh, i mean i can't give you the exact numbers but a child would need more amount of oxygen than an adult or than a person who has well developed organs to you know perform at the similar uh, stage so definitely uh, would require a lot of oxygen to you know make sure that uh, they are you know training to adapt in a positive way okay and the next question from vani ayub uh, overtraining is imbalance between training and recovery the main duty of trainer is to focus on the trainee's work load and recovery if this happens in the presence of a trainer or coach then what is the duty of a trainer so see this could happen uh, a lot with young uh, coaches uh, you know uh, who mostly like go through this process and then you know at a later stage like see the red flag and then they realize like oh you know this was too much and then retrospectively try to you know um, balance out the um, you know the training and the recovery while a more experienced coach uh, probably has made those mistakes and has learned from that and uh, you know would be in a better position to judge okay is this too much uh, you know am i is the child recovered enough but at any point if you see those red flags the child is not improving his motivation is down you know he is uh, getting tired so quickly um, and any of those symptoms that if you see them just stop stop and reassess you know give them few days off <clears throat> see how you know they're responding to like some time off from you know like a rigid training or you know something like that just just have kids to like you know make sure they have fun uh, you know that could take off some of the like the psychological part of the overtraining so any time a young coach or anyone as such sees that you know a child is overtraining uh, and if he feels like this is too much for this child then just stop right there and reassess yes madam the next question from ganesh sg what kind of attention has gained importance than developing physical growth and strength how to convey this to parents so that they understand and educate their child uh, sorry could you repeat the question again want of attention has gained the importance than rather developing the physical growth and strength how to convey this to the parents so that they understand and educate their child right i think a big part of this is uh, educating the parents as well that you know it's not uh, like uh, like you know if there is a very enthusiastic parent who just wants to see his or her kid as an elite athlete and uh, does not know how to go about it and he feels like the coach is the best person to you know go about this but is it, it is the responsibility of the coach to you know counsel the parents that you know uh, this is the place that your child is in you know by doing this much we may cause harm but by doing this you know it could lead to you know a, like a long career in sport probably or you know like prevent burnout so i think uh, just um, you know counseling the parents as well on regular basis uh, and you know sometimes even parents feel like oh i'm sending my kid every day uh, he's not making him do enough let's change a coach uh, and then you know let's go to a coach who's like you know uh, you know making my child work harder so you know more is not the answer the answer is that it has to be optimum yeah that's absolutely right uh, the next one uh, is from rajkumar ji what are the precautionary measures to avoid injuries at high altitude training uh injuries at uh, high altitude training uh mostly like if you are trying to i mean as i said like you know uh, children require more oxygen than uh, adults so if you are tr- trying to train a child at high altitude uh i don't think it would necessarily be a good idea uh because you know the child's oxygen demands are uh, uh, you know very high plus acclimatization as uh, i have told you like you know the like children uh they don't acclimatize very easily as we adults do so i think acclimatization is and you know oxygen levels i think those are the two most important factors 
there is another question from Jed. Uh, children till age of 16 are high in energy. How to detect the super compensation condition or hypertrophy in those aged children? I mean, like try and connect super compensation to hypertrophy? Is the How to detect the super compensation condition or hypertrophy in those aged children? How to detect super compensation condition one? Second, or to detect hypertrophy in those aged children? How to detect? Because children are full with Wim Vigor, high in energy till the age of 16. So how to so detect? Hypertrophy would require uh, like testosterone, like the androgens, the body hormones. Uh, and that would happen at a certain age. So, you know, uh, trying to, I think he's trying to ask whether super, comp how do you relate super compensation and hypertrophy? Uh, at that age, uh, like super compensation is more like you're giving training, you're giving enough recovery and the child is improving. You're seeing, you're seeing visible improvement in his performance. Then you're giving another training stimulus and you give enough recovery and you're seeing that the child is improving. So I think, uh, you know, and, in, and also in like in young ages, like, you know, the Flexibility is more important than hypertrophy. The neuromuscular kind of strength is more important than um, hypertrophy. So I'm not sure what he's trying to ask. <laughs> okay. But if this is somewhere, uh, something that he's looking for. Uh, Madam, can you suggest the causes of pain in the toe of 100 meter runners? Toe of 100 meter runners. Pain in the toe of 100 meter runners. Suggest the it causes could be of a the lot pain. of things actually. You know, it requires an examination. It could be a bony thing, it could be a tendon thing, it could be a ligament injury. So there are a lot of different things that could be there. Uh, and you know, uh, if it's something that is not reducing by you know you reducing training, um, it could or it could be even be growing pains. So I think like uh, if there is something like this, uh, get medical help and you know find out what is actually going on with the child. Okay, and uh, probably we may take another two questions, then we'll wind up the session. Uh, what is the age at which the child should go or fit to go for the fitness centers or physical exercises? Okay, so now this, uh, the whole trend of, you know, sending younger athletes, you know, like there are a lot of um, uh, trainers of gym who deal with a lot of, you know, young athletes. Um, and first thing is wherever you're sending your kid, is he aware of what he's doing? Is he certified, uh, and certified just so that he knows he's doing like, we, we don't want to do more harm than good. So just to prevent that harm, uh, like, uh, you know, there's a lot of, um, athletes that, I mean, a lot of young children who are going into like, you know, gym classes and everything, but making sure that whoever is training the child knows what part of the development uh, spectrum that he is, what he is, uh, you know, what are his goals and, you know, uh, like, you know, making sure that, you know, the athlete is, uh, or the young child is not overtrained, uh, you know, just because, you know, the child is coming enthusiastic every day does not mean, you know, you make them do more. You have to, even then, like the trainer should know what he's doing. So, you know, like probably a certified coach and, you know, people who know what they're doing. Okay. So it was a really wonderful session. In fact, uh, no, uh, because of the time or else we would have been continuing it. So definitely, as I had been telling you uh, that, you know, you have and Kiranji as well as Alexander sir and Lakshmiji has taken this forum into a different level where we have conceived uh, and where we are now by grace of God and your supports. So we wholeheartedly thank you for making time. We know how busy you are being a practitioner as well as not to give this kind of lecture and encouraging all our young participants. We are viewing both in YouTube as well as uh, Zoom and it has reached to many of them and I think definitely they will take out the key notes, whatever you have given the key points. 
and it will help in the long run for not to overburden, not to overtrain. And the thing is, whatever it is, just enjoy. Don't pressurize anyone, anything for achieving beyond the potentials. Definitely. Just, yes. Thank you so much for having me and giving me this opportunity to speak. I am extremely grateful and humbled. And in fact, uh, I could see even our the former spe previous speaker, Alexander sir, is enjoying nicely. Even Lakshmi sir and even Kiran Kulkarniji, all the three speakers of the day, they have enjoyed the session and all the three speakers in real sense, you know, as the module we have framed with Lakshmi ji, first let it be yoga, then the sports medicine, then go for the nutrition. The sequence, what he has given, it was a wonderful and perfect. And what we can you know, uh, it is just his experience, which has led to a great idea. And I'd like to uh, tell our participants and delegates that uh, tomorrow we have on nutrition and health. So one of the important speaker who is a Padma Shri from uh, CFTRI Mysore, his products or the Institute product goes to even NASA. Uh, no, lifeless samples of the food products goes and they are into, the Institute itself is a CSIR esteemed premier institute for food and nutrition. So he will be speaking then one of our allied trustee who has been working in Saudi Arabia for 13 years in a renowned uh, hospital on nutrition, parental nutrition, he will be speaking. Then we have from Malaysia, Wen Rosliji. So it will be a wonderful talk again tomorrow. So request all of you that we'll be seeing you tomorrow at 10 a.m. sharp. And before we go uh, sign it off, we request Lakshmi ji to put his comments being our advisor. So Lakshmi sir, I am troubling you again. No, oh, it's my pleasure, uh, Professor. Uh, indeed, I'm very happy and all the three speakers raised our you know, uh, understanding level to a, a new height. It's a wonderful presentation. I have to thank all the three speakers, uh, the, particularly the, uh, Dr. Kiran, uh, Dr. Ale Professor Alexander, and uh, uh, budding uh, sports medicine expert, uh, Dr. Kathy Vakaria. It was wonderful. So we are carrying a big note out of these three presentation, children are not miniature adults, follow the proper system of training, avoid uh, no burnouts, avoid uh, old training injuries, and uh, you, you need to go with uh, the, the, the uh, sensitive phases, its uh, variations, and so on and so forth. It is a wonderful uh, input, and particularly, I, again, I repeat, uh, Prof, uh, Professor Alexander, your, your uh, new idea, new concept is a trendsetter. Every person in the profession should think uh, twice before they start operate something on a sports development program uh, anywhere in the world. It's a wonderful message you have made it, interdisciplinary interaction to prevent injuries. Prevention is uh, bigger than curing, fine. Uh, so nice, we, we, it was a feast. We enjoyed it. Even we are not hungry. We don't mind, uh, no, uh, <laughs> engaging for a few more hours. But time is a limit. So nice of you all, and uh, hope to meet again and again with the banner of uh, uh, SCT and the uh, comrade uh, Professor uh, Santanu uh, the, Das. We will meet again, and I thank once again for uh, organizing such a beautiful. Uh, no sessions. Uh, my, my congratulations to the SCT and the team and uh, in person, Dr. Professor Santanu Das. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Alexander, sir, Dr. Khyati Wakariyaji, and uh, Kiran, sir, and Lakshmi, sir. Again, we'll be meeting soon sure. with that hope and aspiration in our mind. We'll see post lockdown, post COVID, we'll be again back and we'll be then <laughs> to have lots of discussions going on and for the betterment of the society and improvement of the nation for the young kids. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Namaste. Thank you. Jai Hind. Namaste. Jai Hind.